call our Tuesday, September 8th, 2020, regular governing board meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Uh, roll call, let it be shown that Miss Reed, Mrs. Ordway are here physically, and Mrs. Excuse me, Miss Frank is here telephonically. We will stand to do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And for our moment of silence, um, we do have uh, the anniversary of 9-11 coming up. Uh, uh, let's keep keep that in our thoughts. And also um, all of our students, teachers, parents, um, and the remainder of our employees, let's just keep everyone in mind and, and remember that uh, decisions we make tonight are going to be within the best interests of all of our stakeholders. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, next up, Ms. O, we, do, we will um, make a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. I move we adopt the agenda as presented. I second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Why isn't my voting not coming up? Okay, we are going to go. Oh, there it is. We are going to go straight to our return to school report with Dr. Zerbach. Okay. Uh, good evening, President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Finch. Um, as we have always stated, it is our pleasure to be here this evening uh, to provide to you uh, this report. In the past, uh, you will recall that this uh, report has been called the COVID-19 report. And so we have relabeled it now as um, our public benchmark metrics uh, continue to look um, positive that uh, it is now the return to school um, report. Okay, as far as the um, next slide for our agenda, we'll have sunshine stories as we always do, uh, and then we'll have some return to school updates and then some questions and answers. Uh, note, President Ordaway, that the return to learning section that is usually incorporated within um, this report is a preview item, and so that will be a separate report. Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. That will be later on in the um, board meeting. Okay. So with our first sunshine story, it comes from Vista Peak, and this is a wonderful uh, sunshine story highlighting the leadership of Principal Brian Feinberg and his uh, leadership team at Vista Peak. This came from a staff member, and I will not read the whole thing, but I will highlight just a couple lines. Uh, and so this staff member said that, quote, three weeks ago I was feeling anxiety in about coming back to in-person learning. I can firmly say that our outstanding leadership team at Vista Peak reassured us that we would take every precaution possible. While they could not promise that we would not potentially get sick, they did promise that the use of masks, shields, hand washing stations would be implemented, and then in time it would feel like the new normal. And within one week, it did feel like the new normal. The staff member then goes on again to thank the staff members, janitors, et cetera, at Vista Peak who are all helping it, the return to school at Vista Peak be a success. So uh, thank you, Ms. Rivera, and thank you, Principal Feinberg and your team. Our next story, Will uh, comes from Village Meadows and Developmental Preschool, and Dr. Galligan will share it with us. Yes, indeed. So we have had a number of our developmental preschools uh, begin with us, and this comes to us from Village Meadows, our in-person um, program. And our students have done a wonderful job of adjusting to wearing masks and adhering to all of the safety practices. And you can see from the pictures there, the kids are excited to be, to be here. A developmental preschool teacher um, was overheard, overheard one of her kids tell another student, I can't wait for all the students to come back to school. And that just builds on that need for socialization and student connection. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. And our third and final sunshine story is related to the comment you made, uh, President Ordway, before a moment of silence with respect to 9-11 this week. 
uh, we had a staff member send Dr. Finch some photos of uh, flags that were made by some of the students at the Free Safe Learning Space site at North Terra Canyon. And we did think that uh, these flags that are going to be sent to um, the mayor of New York right now in honor of September 11th and also one that is honor of the first responders. We thought this was just um, a wonderful um, piece that the students made and so we wanted to share that. Okay, and now as we transition to our return to school work team updates, we will begin with Mr. Miglarino as he will give us an update for the public health benchmarks from ADHS. Mr. Miglarino. Uh, President Ordway, members of the board, uh, Dr. Finch. So uh, this slide here shows uh, the actual uh, um, last five reports um, from the Maricopa County uh, dashboard, uh, Maricopa County Health Department dashboard uh, for, uh, for schools. And you can see a uh, you know, fairly significant improvement in the numbers over time. Uh, I would say the rate of positivity uh, was relatively flat this last uh, reporting period. And I think what's worth uh, also noting is not just that the numbers are improving over time, it's for what reporting period um, these reports are. And I know Dr. Zerbach shared this several weeks ago, uh, but the latest report from uh, September 3rd or September 4th was really for that period uh, back at the beginning of August. <laughs> so for that two week uh, uh, period from, uh, I think that says August 9th through the 22nd. <laughs> and and so there is a little bit of delay in uh, the information that we do receive. But I think the takeaway from this slide is that the, uh, the numbers continue to improve over time. Uh, and, and that is certainly uh, good news. Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. Given that there is a preview item later in today's agenda uh, with respect to um, return to in-person school, we did want to take a moment to bring us back to our conversations that we had months ago when we talked about the CDC's decision tree um, matrix and the tool that has been used uh, for schools and organizations across the country with respect to reopening um, with COVID-19 mitigation strategies. And so again, uh, we did look at this, this started our conversations for all of our teams, and we used this um, over the past uh, several months as we made our plans for uh, return to school in person. Just as a reminder, again, um, our website for those who are uh, tuning in this evening, we do have a dvusd.org slash return to school site with uh, much information. Uh, there is an operational safety plan, which we know is of interest. Uh, board members, you received uh, m the vast, vast majority of that in the board update on Friday in the um, attachment. And so that was uh, placed on the website today on the operational safety plan. And so parents are able to see that. Uh, again, the high level plan has been available for uh, over two months. Uh, this one adds in uh, many additional details to it. We also have the COVID-19 reporting procedures that um, are present on the website. And then our parent communication is always documented and logged on that return to school site. Okay, the next piece that I wanted to share with you is some photos from our sample model schools. And so this first slide comes from Deer Valley High School. You can see in the, the first two Pictures on the left are from the cafeteria areas, and so you can see how the school is marking off, uh, attempting to provide um, at least some space um, there between the kids when they're eating. Uh, you can see in the middle slide that there are patio tables that have been spaced out. And then on the right, you're seeing an example from one of the classrooms. I believe this was a math classroom that I was in, um, where they have spaced the desk out as far um, as they can, given the number of students that they expect to be in the classrooms. I do want to uh, note, as I noted in the board update for you, that um, again, these photos are not there to um, guarantee in essence that this is exactly how it will look on any specific campus, but they are photos that give um, an idea of how principals are trying to utilize the space, utilize different mitigation features. Um, and so, of course, it would depend on each school's enrollment, each school's exact size, is it indoor, is it outdoor? 
things um, like that as far as how they would actually be. This next slide comes from Sunset Ridge. Uh, you can see on the far right, that is a kindergarten uh, walkway corridor. And so you can see how the school is helping the students during the transition, uh, along with the sign that's on the sidewalk. The middle is the cafeteria. Again, in this one, you can see how the uh, cafeteria has been arranged to add some additional spacing between tables and also that the tables are facing in one direction um, and not two directions. This third slide comes from Sierra Verde, and in uh, this particular slide, you can see the front office set up, which many um, of you have already seen. But note that there are directional markers for the foot traffic and also for where uh, parents would stand once they are in there. Because, as you know, there are capacity limits that we have set in all of our front offices, including here in the district office as well. And so many of them have been uh, modeled after that. In the middle, you see an example in the nurse's office. And then on the right, again, you see a sample classroom in terms of how they have spaced their desk apart. Okay, on our fourth slide here, this comes from Village Meadows. You can see in the middle with the red X's, the spacing for students in the bathrooms and where students should stand. You see another example of a cafeteria arranged with one-way direction for the students to face. On the upper left, you can see the tables, and I put this one here on purpose uh, because there have been some questions uh, with respect to will everyone have desk or a certain type of furniture. And so the, the short answer is the, the furniture by and large is the furniture they have. And so we look to utilize and space that furniture and use that furniture in the best way that you can. So you can see that in this particular example, um, we did remove one chair that would be at that table. So it's reduced by a student and then also spacing out the table some um, that are in that classroom. Now, sometimes, depending on the enrollment, we may not be able to have that exact spacing between the tables. And so when that or in those types of situations, we do what's called the potting. And so for the potting, we may have tables that are closer together. And then we space sections of the room out that are three to six feet um, apart so that if something were to happen, that we could hopefully minimize the number of students that would need to be on a quarantine at home for the 14 days. And so the pod would quarantine, not the entire class. And then finally on the right, you can see another example of a uh, classroom. I believe this was a fifth grade classroom um, where they expect a number of students to return um, to the class. And so for that spacing, uh, we tried for three feet uh, between our um, desks. And lastly, I would, um, my final comment here is that a, the principals have been doing tours. Uh, today we had many principals go to um, these school sites, and so they are getting a nice visual of what it looks like. Some of them have seen the, well, all of them have already seen the photos, but some wanted to see it in person, and so they are uh, transforming their spaces right now um, as we speak. Okay, and in the next uh, slide would be Ms. Mock with our uh, PPE. Ms. Mock. Thank you, Dr. Zerbach. Um, in conjunction with the plan for spacing at the schools, we uh, have spoken at a couple different meetings about the personal protective equipment that we are purchasing for our staff and students. And um, starting today and going through next Tuesday, we have the third round of PPE basically being distributed to the schools. It includes a third delivery of hand sanitizer. And uh, a question that's been on a lot of parents' minds, so important that apparently I put it here twice, is the cloth masks for students. We've got uh, just under 35,000 masks, uh, one for every student who will be returning and some spares as well, uh, going out to the schools next week so that they will have them on hand before students return. In addition to that, we still have more on stock and actually were uh, awarded, um, I think over 60,000 additional masks from City of Phoenix. We will not have any problems making sure that every staff member and every student has a cloth face mask when they need one. Uh, in addition, we continue to order and pay for, I think, the one item that we think is going to be used the most, and that, of course, is the hand sanitizer. So we had our first big order at the end of July. We are working on our second order now to make sure that every classroom has hand sanitizer in stock. Uh, all of our hand sanitizers that we have in stock, the half gallons and the smaller containers that the House has on a regular basis, we were able to confirm today, are 70 and 75% alcohol content. 
So depending on what you read on what the alcohol content needs to be in hand sanitizer, we are at the high end and above uh, to make sure that our hand sanitizer is effective. In addition, we've received most of the face shields we ordered, uh, I think also a couple meetings ago at a board uh, work session, we heard from Dr. Rebecca Sunshine that that um, we talked about the face masks, but then something um, in that presentation as well uh, was talking about the extra layer of protection and the face mask that would protect um, the teachers or staff from anything coming toward them. So the mask is to protect them from um, any um, spread of the disease, but then we've got those face shields that will be in addition. And so we've received most of those. Those will be going out with the orders, um, going out to the campuses starting today and ending next Tuesday. We will have one for every staff member who wants and or needs one for the face shields as well. Uh, at this moment, the face shields um, are to be worn with the cloth, cloth face mask unless um, there's specific written approval to only wear the face shield by itself. But right now it's that double layer of protection. And uh, by Tuesday, September 15th, the schools will have all of the masks and face shields. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mock. And uh, Mr. Miglarino, if you could join in again and give a reminder about the ventilation systems. Yes, thank you. One of the things that uh, we were sharing during um, uh, our presentation with uh, staff last week during the what we refer to as our fireside chat was information regarding the ventilation systems um, that we have throughout our uh, district. And I thought it might be uh, helpful to share that uh, with, the, with the governing board tonight. So we are continuously running the indoor fans. So if uh, you, you, you wanna um, equate this to your home system, instead of the fan being on auto where the fan, the internal fan uh, in, uh, comes on only when the unit is on, we actually run the fans throughout the day even when it's not in the cooling mode, uh, just to help keep things circulated um, because that is filtered air, right? Because it is processing that through the filtration system. Uh, we also bring in outside air throughout the, uh, throughout the day. That's an ASHRAE standard uh, for commercial buildings, uh, which we comply with. Uh, somebody asked, well, what if my school building is uh, much older? Um, and we have replaced all the mechanical systems in the district <laughs> since uh, 2005, thanks to the uh, good fortune of our bond election. And so uh, all of our systems are up to that standard to bring in outside air. We also completely purge the classrooms before the school day starts, uh, just to make sure that there's, um, a, you know, a kind of a fresh start when uh, we're talking about the indoor air quality. We do that as well if we have any reported outbreaks uh, before we send ev even in um, the folks to do the, uh, the heavy cleaning. Uh, some questions, and <clears throat> this has been kind of interesting that people have gotten interested in things that we do <laughs> on the operational side. Uh, but uh, uh, MERV 8 is the uh, ratings uh, for the air filters uh, that, that, we, that we purchase. Uh, the reason for that is uh, twofold. One is our systems are calibrated for that uh, level of MERV rating. Um, there are higher ratings, I will uh, disclose. Um, but we have been notified by our uh, suppliers that the higher rated uh, MERV rated air filters are not available right now. So, um, and they do require a more frequent replacement um, be, because they are more restrictive, but being more restrictive, that would also uh, potentially cause other issues uh, such as slowing down the airflow and air transfer uh, in, in the existing systems that we have. And then I just wanted to, I uh, conclude that uh, uh, because the staff had asked about um, portable uh, HEPA cleaners and things of that nature, uh, we're certainly not opposed to those items. Um, you know, obviously it needs to be safe uh, so that it doesn't create another problem within the classroom. But even uh, the EPA, and I, this is a quote right from their webpage, that portable air cleaners and HVAC filters are not enough to protect people from the viruses that cause COVID-19. Um, just like many of the systems that we have, uh, the ventilation systems in our district are part of a comprehensive plan um, and they need to be taken in their totality, right? So uh, we have the ventilation systems, but we still do sanitizing. Uh, we still do disinfecting. We still doing hand washing. We're still doing mask wearing. So I just wanted to remind everybody that it's not just one thing that's gonna be able to help us mitigate the spread of the virus. Uh, we need to do them uh, in a holistic approach. 
Thank you, Mr. Miglarino. The next slide talks about notification in the event that a uh, outbreak were to occur. There has been an update, uh, Governing Board, since the last time that we met um, on this. ADHS released Emergency Measure 2020-03, which defines an outbreak for a, a public school setting um, or a child care center. And so I took the exact language from the emergency measure and inserted it into this slide so that those tuning in could see. Um, the definition of an outbreak is listed there, and I will read this one. It defines an outbreak as two or more laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 cases among students or staff with onsets within a 14-day period who are epidemiologically linked, that's a tough word, um, do not share a household and were not identified as close contacts of each other in another setting during standard case investigation. Um, what the emergency measure calls for on this is that if an outbreak were to occur in a school, that the district and the school would need to notify all current staff, um, parents, and guardians um, at that school of the outbreak and to let them know the measures that will be taken uh, to continue to help um, mitigate any future outbreaks at that school. And that has to be done within a 24-hour period. Okay? And so, again, that's a new um, uh, requirement that has come up from Emergency Measure 2020-03 um, from ADHS. And that is posted as well, uh, just as a um, FYI, uh, we have that on our operational plan. Okay, in terms of communication, uh, as Mr. Miglarino made mention, we have continued with our Thursday fireside chats. Those take place in the early afternoon. We have had hundreds of staff members that have joined us and we place those on the portal, the recordings, so that those who are not able to join us live can view those at their own pleasure. And then we do our best with the uh, questions that they ask to put those as well in a written PDF format with responses. Uh, we sometimes are not able to respond to those immediately the next day, but we try to get those out um, within three or four working days uh, for them. And then again, as I already uh, mentioned as well, that Return to Learning will have more um, later on. Okay, and with that, I will give it to Mrs. Moffitt uh, for Return to Work Safely. Good evening, President Ordway, Governing Board members. Um, this evening, I'm going to walk you through what we're doing currently for our ADA processes. I'll cover the FFCRA and where we are now. Um, update you on classroom coverage options, which I will discuss again in our later preview item, and some of the things that we're currently doing to support our employee health, wellness, and well-being. So we are, um, if we can go, I don't have the clicker, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. We are um, currently inviting our employees who've already submitted all of their necessary paperwork to engage in the ADA interactive process to what we call interactive meetings. So those of you that are already familiar with what maybe a 504 for a student looks like, a student that may have a disability and qualifies to attend a 504 meeting where the group comes together to discuss what accommodations might look like based on the disability and the environment. This is similar to that, but does have some differences in the employee process. So we're currently completing the, all of these meetings. We um, are mostly focusing, as you remember, if we go back all the way to July, we had many employees that put in for this process in anticipation of requesting the accommodation of online teaching. And then we did not need to move forward as all of our students were moved back onto our home campuses. But we are again looking at, um, at all of these same employees and some who've also put in since to uh, see what their accommodation needs may be if we would be able to offer a work at home option, and if we are not able to offer a work, work at home option, what accommodations they might need in their on-site work environment. And so we ha have stacked these meetings um, as heavily as we can have been able to over the last week so that we can uh, be prepared for what is to come in the upcoming weeks. And then next, um, I shared with you that I would go over again in detail what options we may have um, moving forward when we return to in-person learning. So we, we know that we will be facing situations where we do need to isolate either students or staff members. And in the case in which we need to isolate a staff member, either because they've come in close contact 
with someone at work or someone at home, or because they suffer from symptoms of or of COVID-19 or like COVID-19, we will need to remove them from the on-site workplace. So here are some options that we currently have. We will be able to provide, in some cases, an in-person substitute that can cover the classroom and the instruction, because as you guys know, a substitute can is properly certified um, to provide instruction and supervision. Secondly, we could provide an in-person substitute to cover the classroom for supervision purposes while the teacher continues the instruction from home. And in these cases, the teacher would be well enough to do that and voluntarily be able to do that. Should the teacher not be well enough to do that, of course, they would um, up, uh, qualify for FFCRA days and beyond that could take personal leave, um, sick leave time if they exhausted the FFCRA days. Third, we could also put in a staff member. This staff member could be a classified staff member, a certified staff member, or an exempt staff member. This staff member could come from on-site or can, could come from a different location. This person's responsibility would be to supervise the class and um, would not necessarily need to continue the instruction if the teacher could continue the instruction at home. That fourth bullet also, we specified this one because there still continues over all these years, even back when I was a teacher in DBUSD and an administrator at the campus level, the belief that a classified staff member cannot provide supervision in a classroom, and that is not accurate. Our classified staff members can absolutely provide supervision in a classroom. What they can't do is provide instructional minutes, and that's why we need a certified substitute to be in that room. So it is safe for them to be there. It is safe for them to supervise students, but we would need to also include somebody else that could provide the instruction. So a different teacher or a teacher, the same teacher or a different teacher could provide that instruction um, and could also be on Canvas. And then lastly here, you'll see another option, and that's when a, another staff member, similarly to what you probably are familiar with, substitute rotation of old days, as old as last year, when we had staff members that could rotate into classrooms. Now, this might look a little different is, uh, than that because our, our campuses are building these types of plans in a pandemic environment, and it just is going to look different than what several used to look like. Um, some statistics for you on the next slide. Ms. Ms. Moffitt, if I could, um, on the second bullet point, I know we've had a couple questions. Uh, perhaps you could clarify that in the event a teacher was teaching from home while the students were on campus, um, would they need to use their sick time um, during that um, period or not? So if the employee can continue to teach from home, they're working. So they do not need to use their own time, personal or sick, if they are not well then that is when they would qualify for FFCRA leave. And then if they exhausted the time that FFCRA offers, they could use their own personal sick time. Thank you, Ms. Amavit. So currently we have 415 substitutes that are uh, ready and confirmed for this year to substitute in the brick and mortar setting. Um, 34 substitutes are currently filling long-term vacancies on Canvas. So we have 34 teaching online because of a vacancy. And we have nine additional substitutes that are working on Canvas for those employees that are out on FMLA. So the, uh, not employees, but actually teachers. We also have 24 additional substitutes that are Canvas trained and ready to work in that capacity if necessary. Um, on September 2nd, we also um, facilitated another orientation where we added 18 additional substitutes to the 415. And we are working out a plan currently where each school can be assigned a substitute that will be there on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is, of course, in anticipation of the previous slide that I shared. And that would be last-minute notification that we needed to cover um, a classroom and we would have a substitute that could slide in there to hold the fort down until we were able to solution. We are also currently and will continue to um, process our FFCRA leaves as um, we um, 
opened up our online school, we also, as you know, opened up free learning spaces. And that did trigger or initiate um, a whole handful or more of our employees, mostly classified, who needed to take FFCRA leave for child care purposes. So under these provisions, there are six categories. There is the, the qualifier that if your child's either daycare or school has been shut down because of COVID, then you could qualify for two-thirds pay for up to 12 weeks. So we did see that happen on the classified side. Um, we are also anticipating that perhaps when we come back to in-person learning, see that uh, take an uptick on the certified side. So HR has been very busy with these FFCRA leave processes and so has um, payroll. And just a reminder to you that there are the six categories that our employees could qualify. As of now, legally, um, this only is a provision provided through December, but we anticipate that uh, they will extend that. And then we have been um, sharing many of our employee supports with our employees. This through this last week, we did it in the fireside chats, but we've been sending these resources also out through Monica's Deer Valley Voice. So information from our EAP, how to log in, and just expanding all of the options that they do have under our EAP. We know that our employees are familiar with the fact that they can receive counseling services and other benefits like that, but just going to the EAP portal right now is a really helpful place to go. They even give you shopping options, um, things that you can get from Costco and, and so on that would be really um, beneficial at this time. And then, as I mentioned, we can go to the next slide. We shared in um, the fireside chat, we did some research on the most common things that employers should be advising of their employees during this pandemic year, things that could be helpful to them, and they fall into these four categories. And the first one, and of course, we were articulate in explaining what they could do under each of these four areas, but the first one was making sure that they purposefully unplug and disengage from their work. Um, whether that be the, the physical way they set up their homes or um, if they're working in their classrooms, making sure that they're leaving at an appropriate time. We can't always do that every day, but we need to be making sure that we do it often in order to keep ourselves healthy. And then the second one, of course, is taking care of your physical health. When your body's healthy, it improves your mind health as well. Taking time to stay connected with other people, and that um, means socially. And then lastly, making sure that you're taking care of your mental health and we provided some strategies underneath that one as well. And that's all I have for today's report. Okay, and that will uh, conclude our presentation, uh, President Ordway. And again, although I mentioned it twice, I will mention it a third time that the uh, return to learning component is on the agenda as item 7A um, as a preview item. So uh, board members, if we have any questions for this portion um, we can ask them if not we can wait until we get a little bit more detailed where it would uh, bring all of this information together does it would that make more sense to you I'm sorry. Say that again. Um, so they did some bare bones here but when they do the uh, in-depth return there's going to be so much more in that so um, it might be wiser to wait until we do the complete return to school plan to ask questions. I don't know. Will that include additional information on PPE? If we ask the question, it will, right? Yes, it could. I don't. I don't think there's an exact slide on there, uh, Miss Mock, but uh, we can answer it now. Okay, okay or, that's or fine. Later, it is. I, I'm. We can go back any time we want. Ms. Frank, does that sound okay to you? Uh, that's fine. I do have a couple of questions about this presentation, but if everyone is in agreement, they want to wait until the end of the next presentation. Um, I've written down my questions, so that's fine. Okay, Ms. Reed? I'm fine to wait. Okay, so then that would uh, bring us to... Finance report. Thank you. 
Thank you, President Ordway. Uh, I am pleased to bring forward the first um, iteration of the finance reports for the 2021 school year. We're going to start with the enrollment report. Although I enjoy presenting these reports to you, it's not quite as fun as it has been in years past. Starting with the enrollment report as of August 26th, which was our 18th day in session, we are down 1,650 students from this time last year, which equates to about 4.8%. Um, most of our schools are down from what we projected. At this time, I think we had four schools that were over projection with the rest of the schools being one or more um, students below what we projected. Ms. Mock, before you continue, could you tell me where you get those numbers from? Sure. We get a data poll from Power Schools. ISNT does a student count report for us, and we pull it directly from that report and put it into this format, including the teacher count per school so that we can see the average class size for each grade at each So that's uh, pretty much a running um, mm -hmm. actual time Correct. number. Thank Correct. you. Yep, you're welcome. Any sorry, Mrs. Oh, Mock. Uh -huh. Sorry, did you say the date for this report? I apologize. I did. It's August 26th. Thank you. And we've had one report since then, but we always, it was the day after the information was due for the board report. So we usually use the last one from the prior month. So this is August report. And then, of course, come October, we'll start with the September report. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. And, and I didn't mean to interrupt right there. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> where we get those numbers from and, and how much in real time they are. Yep, absolutely. Um, but that actually will lead us directly into the m and budget report for August. Uh, you will see something a little different than what we've seen in years past. Typically on the first report ending August, we will see a little bit of budget balance remaining typically in certified and classified staff contracts. And then of course in the state retirement and social security lines. Because we know if you scroll to the bottom of the 2021 budget line, it shows that we have a budget capacity of $241.8 million approximately. And we know that that's not going to be our final number. That's what we adopted, but as we saw in the prior report, enrollment is down. And so that means that that number will have to be adjusted before the school year is over. So because of that, we have captured anything that we haven't spent or don't have encumbered to date in the committed budget balances column, because we normally at this time would see one to $200,000 that we would expect for carry forward because there are going to be so many changes and we just don't know what that final budget's going to look like. We are not willing uh, or ready to say that we're going to have any carry forward at this time. We did footnote that in um, finance font, or you know, also known as gym font, uh, right below the projected carry forward line as well. So we have that on there. Um, we will know more when uh, following the 40th day. Our 40th day is uh, September 29th. We might not have all of that information in time for the first meeting in October. Um, those budget reports would not come out till October 15th, and I believe the board meeting in October is October 14th. So we will have uh, better information for you probably by the November meeting. Right now it is still really early. We know um, as little at this time as we normally do. We just know that there are a couple additional variables this year that we have not uh, fortunately had to deal with in the past few years. And I will take any questions. Does anyone have questions? No? Okay, I, I do. Um, with the federal um, meal plan, mm -hmm. um, have we gotten reimbursed for our, our summer that wasn't really summer feeding and then the summer and now we're going into the winter? Because that's got, got to be um, heavy on our um, food services department. Uh, President Ordway, yes, we uh, have been reimbursed for the meals that we served um, in June. Um, which was the beginning of the summer feeding, uh, the official summer feeding. Right. But we were actually doing what they classified as summer feeding uh, all the way back to March. Right. Uh, so we have received all the reimbursements all the way through June, okay. and we have submitted the reimbursements for um, July and August at this point. And then um, through December, how would that be 
time-wise and how is that going to affect um, our budget? Um, so timing wise, I don't see it creating any issues from a cash flow standpoint. Okay. Um, from, from, from the timing perspective, uh, the amount is going to be much less uh, because our meal counts um, were down at the, at the start uh, for uh, August. And uh, since the recent ruling from USDA that now allows us to go back to summer feeding from now through at least the end of December, um, we'll have to see how much the participation increases as a result of that. So uh, as of September 1st, now we're back to quote unquote summer feeding um, and uh, we're gonna have to see how that will change what the reimbursement um, will be going forward. That currently that's only through the end of December. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, Ms. Mock. I'll just take any additional questions. That was it. Oh, okay. No, Ms. Frank? No questions, thank you. Okay. You're done, done? That's it. Finished, done? Okay. Wow. Uh, so at this point in time, normally we would normally abnormally the new normal uh, do uh, our call to the public. Um, no, uh, no. Uh, yeah, at this point in time, there are comments. There are no comments that um, are referring to any of the topics that are listed for action or consent. Um, Correct. This, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Correct. You are. There's no uh, actions related to the agenda items, so. For action or consent. For action, yep. So we'll move on to Ms. Frank. Oh, Ms. Frank, you're doing the old, you're, you're doing the motions. Okay. Go ahead. So um, item 4A, old business. I move that the governing board approve proposed ASDA 2021 political agenda item. I second. Mrs. O'Brien, did you want to? Um, talk about anything on that because I, I, I'm not sure if anyone sent you anything to change what, what we had agreed on. Um, I didn't receive anything from anybody, but essentially the, the board needs to give direction to the delegate and the alternate on how they would vote um, at the ASBA or the Arizona School Board Association Delegate Assembly in the middle of October. So we can, um, in the past, I mean, there's been a couple of different directions taken by the board where um, we can vote to approve the agenda and, and give the delegate um, latitude in, in their best discretion at the time because there can be changes made um, uh, amendments brought up at the meeting, or we can go through item by item and decide as a board on very specific direction. Uh, Ms. Frank? Um, since we elected a delegate, I'm fine with uh, giving the delegate the latitude to make some decisions if things change um, during the uh, delegate assembly. I believe that Ms. Reed has a pulse of the board and is a very trustworthy board member. So elected delegate, use your latitude. Why, thank you. I will use my best discretion and vote on behalf of the board. So we just need to vote in, I guess, in favor or against the agenda, <laughs> the entire thing then. So the motion so, is to approve it. So we, so the motion is to approve it. So if we approve it, then that um, gives Mrs. Reed the to, to do what we just discussed. So um, the motion um, is there. It's been seconded. All those who um, agree, say aye. 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 And there are no opposed. Thank you, Mrs. Reed, and thank you, Mrs. O'Brien. Oh. Uh, uh, Mrs. Frank made the motion and Mrs. Reed seconded. Correct. So are you ready to move on to consent agenda? Yes, we're ready. Okay. I move that the governing board approve consent agenda items 5A through 5R. I second. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 There is no opposed opposition, so we will move to 6A. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to pre-approve the agenda as presented. I second. Do we need any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 No opposed. It didn't pop up yet for me. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, 6B. Okay, I move that the Governing Board accept the Administration's recommendation to adopt the Deer Valley Unified School District Pathways Instructional Calendar for 2020-21. I second. Gary, did you want to elaborate on that? I will actually take this one, President Ordway. Well, I had, or, okay, go ahead. If you will remember, we actually had this item about this time last year as well. Yes. And it was Pathways first year. Um, and we said we will adopt the calendar on a more regular basis from now on. Uh, it wasn't ready in February when we typically do the annual upcoming and next year's calendar for the district. And then this really weird thing called COVID hit, and it was about two weeks ago we realized we missed it. And so we do apologize for bringing it this late. Normally you should see this uh, before July 1st. Uh, Pathways is already in session and uh, doing a great job. This calendar mirrors the same calendar that they had last year with the three different sessions uh, for the school year. And with that, I'll be able, uh, happy to answer any questions if I can. Do we have any questions? Mrs. Reed? No. No, okay. We have zero questions. Um, so let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, there is no opposed, so let's get to the best part of the meeting right now. Uh, 7A, that would be our return to learning plan, and Dr. Galligan, you can begin. And, and board members, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this, Dr. Galligan, if we have questions when you're completed with a portion, should we ask then? President Ordway, whatever whatever is the board's preference is fine. I think it'd probably be better to go all the way through because different parts might answer different parts. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Now, President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Finch and viewing guests, this preview item for our return to in-person learning will provide important information for you, our staff, and our parent, guardians, and community. What you will see here are the objectives for our meeting, and they're pretty simple, just the, the phased in timeline um, that um, has been updated since Dr. Finch presented it at the study session, our return to learning models, and our stakeholder communication plan. So we will start right now um, with the phased in start. And as I said, Dr. Finch provided information to all of us in the board study session two weeks ago. We will share a modified phased in start to that current, um, that's based on our current benchmark metrics. So I'm gonna turn this over right now to Dr. to actually Mr. Miglarino for our safety protocols. Uh, one of the things that uh, we continue to look at are some of the safety protocols that we have um, throughout the district. Uh, we have some operational plans that uh, we continue to update. Uh, so uh, special thanks to um, everybody on the ALS team that's helping uh, with the model classrooms that you saw pictures from from the previous report um, <clears throat> to the, the folks that are helping us with uh, the, the detailed information that we can share on how we can ensure that uh, our our facilities uh, and campuses are going to be ready to uh, and as safe as possible for uh, students to return to in-person learning. Uh, so I'm not going to read all of these to you, but this is just, uh, you know, kind of an overview of our campus uh, safety plan, our classroom safety plans, our, our, our instruction, some of the things that we would be putting in place that wouldn't be typical for us, but would be under the current situation that we're contending with. Um, 
And I will tell you that uh, with much of, uh, of what we are currently developing, it will likely change over time. Um, so uh, we are continually monitoring and adjusting uh, when it comes to these things so that we can make sure that uh, we create the safest environment possible. Thank you, Jim. Dr. Zerbach will uh, share our phased in opening plan. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Galligan. So this slide contains information that um, just about everybody, I think, living in the Deer Valley Unified uh, School District boundaries has been waiting to see. Um, so I will uh, walk us through it here. So on September the 24th, that is a Thursday, uh, we are proposing that we begin our staggered phase in plan. And the first wave of students that would enter according to this plan would be our developmental pre-K and Head Start. And that really refers to all of them because as you know, we have had our preschool students already back in person. And so this would be reintegrating everyone back in uh, to the in-person experience. We would also bring back our kindergarten students, our high school seniors. So you could think of it as the, the first in the end, right? As far as uh, who would be coming back. And then we would look to resume normal activities for our students at Vista Peak. So again, just to clarify, Vista Peak has been in session for in-person um, services, but they have not been for the regular schedule. So there's a rotating schedule that they have been doing. Uh, this means that we would bring the students back at Vista Peak for their normal five-day schedule beginning on the 24th. So again, that would be our first wave of students to come back being consistent with what we have been relating to you and proposing to you for the past month is this notion of the phases and the waves. And so the next wave then would follow on Tuesday, September the 29th. And the reason that it's on a Tuesday is because Monday is a no school day. That was already on the calendar. It is a fall break day. And so due to there not being school, we would start that second phase on the 29th. And as you can see there, that would consist of first through third grades returning um, to in person our middle school. And you can see it denoted there with the asterisk. That's for Deer Valley Middle School, Desert Sky Middle School, and Hillcrest that they would begin. And then our juniors. So whereas the prior week our seniors started, now we would phase in our juniors. Then for that would last for four business days. And then on Monday, October 5th, you can see that we layer in another phase. Four through six grades are three middle schools. They would layer in their eighth grade students. And then our high school sophomores would start as well during that week. That would lead us into Wednesday, October the 14th. And again, I want to remind folks that that is a, a second fall break, and that is why it's a Wednesday and not a Monday. And so there is no school on Monday, October 12th, nor on Tuesday, October the 13th. So the next eligible day, if you will, uh, to phase in would be the Wednesday. And that day also coincides with the original date that the governing board voted on um, to have in-person school. And so at that point, we would have all of our students would be eligible to resume in person on that Wednesday, the um, 14th of October. And so just to be clear with that, we would layer back in our seventh and eighth grade students that are at our K-8 schools and then our high school freshmen to round it out. With this as well, there are, um, as we have talked to you before, some implications with free safe learning. And so we have been in planning with community ed and with our K-6s, K-8s and our middle schools um, to ensure that there would be a transition uh, for a free space um, to homeschool sites for a short period of time because the majority or many of the students um, will be consumed into the regular school once they start. And so um, that has been factored into um, our planning. Thank you, Dr. Zerb. Oh, sorry, Dr. Zerb, could you just repeat that about the free um, learning spaces? Yes, we would need to start transitioning our free safe sites back to the home sites. And the reason for that is the schools that we are clustering at right now, they will need to prepare their classrooms. And so since we are using many of their uh, classroom spaces, we will need to move those out, put them back in the um, regular home sites so that those six sites can prepare for students to return.
Thank you, Dr. Zerbach. The next four slides take these four dates and, and split them out um, into both what our students will be doing as far as when they come back and our staff. And Ms. Moffitt is going to talk about these next four slides. Okay, so you see on the left-hand side, preschool and Head Start um, will begin, and it's specifically all preschool. As you know, much of our preschool is in session. What will, what will be intended to go away is the online side and the brick-and-mortar side will be on, um, open across the board. Kindergarten, high school seniors, and as uh, Dr. Zerbach explained, Vista Peak as well. So what that means for our staff, if you look at the right-hand side, if our staff member has in their teaching day one of these groups, then they are expected to report to on-site. So we are scheduling that to be three work days in advance of the day the students return. The intention of those three work days is to give the staff the opportunity to set up what's necessary to onboard with the principal and to review all safety protocols and procedures. We also know that in those three days, we will have staff members that um, whose own children do need to be supervised due to school closures. So we know that it is um, possible that some of our staff members will need some flexibility because of that reason. But then come time for the active teaching day, we will not be able to be flexible like we were during those three days. But I do want to point out that we those three days we may need to be for staff members. I also want to point out that we've uh, some staff members have voiced that they would like more than three days to prepare. And so they are welcome to take more than those three days. They have access to their classrooms right now if they are able to get there um, to work on those classrooms. As far as their responsibilities during this time with the students that they currently have, they will not be expected during those three days to be actively teaching lessons, but they will be expected to be teaching, to be checking in with their students and grading the assignments that are assigned for those days as they transition. On the first student day, we are anticipating that they will either continue with those same students or perhaps have new students based on where our parents choose to move their own child. Um, whether they want them to return to brick and mortar or to remain online. And again, all staff members who have any of these students in their school day will need to report to on-site. So that does mean um, that some teachers, for example, the PE teacher that has a kindergartner will be expected to report to on-site work, will teach that kindergarten class, and then can go back to their um, offices or respective classrooms and continue their other classes until the full transition has taken place. Thursday, September, I'm sorry, the next uh, uh, rotation would be the following Tuesday on September 29th, so first through third grade, seventh grade at our true middle schools, and our juniors are now added to the high school realm. Sorry. Same okay. thing here for staff members three days in advance. Student learning will be asynchronous for those three days. That doesn't mean that the teachers aren't teaching them. It just means that there are no active lessons going on for those three days. And again, teachers that have any of these students in their schedule would be expected. Sorry, can I interrupt just for a second? So when you say, like in the first iteration, that we have our high school seniors coming back, so if you... If you have, if you're a high school teacher with one high school senior in your class or two high school juniors in a class, let's say you teach, teach sophomores, you will come back to class to teach that one student in class? That is the current plan, yes. Okay. And then on October 5th, same as I have explained, except for grades four through six, true middle schools and for eighth grade and high school sophomores. And then the final phase would be um, for our K-8s, the seventh and eighth grade phasing in and the freshmen. Um, to clarify, Ms. O'Brien, we know that there will be situations like that that come up and that there would be some staff members that may ask 
um, or a principal that could even call human resources and ask for uh, an exception for some reason, would it be possible um, for a staff member to work a little bit differently? I'm thinking with one senior, perhaps a request like that might be made or perhaps not if, if the employee has no. Well, I guess my, the concern I have there is, is somewhat of a safety one too, because if you are just one-on-one -on -one in the classroom, that there could be some concerns about that. So um, I, I, I just don't know how many of those particular scenarios we have, but there will be many things such as that right. that I'm sure that they will ask. Yeah. Ms. O'Brien, our principals can help with that too, right? So if those were the exact, if that was an exact situation, our principals could support with that, with having uh, either an additional staff member or someone uh, <laughs> to help support in that um, scenario. They have flexibility at the campus level to work with you all, is what I hear you saying, to, to make requests. Yeah, there, yes, always. Have, you have the opportunity to make a request, and there will be situations when we know we will need to be flexible. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moffitt. So as we come back to on campus, we will have two models. Um, you saw both of these models this past summer, and we've made some refinements. One of them is our return to learning on campus, which is in person, and then our Deer Valley Online Academy. What you'll see here is um, for the on campus, our students return to their campus learning environment for instruction in person with teachers. And as you've seen in the previous report, with that focus on safety practices for all of our staff, students, and others on campus. Deer Valley Online Academy um, is, will be different than what we started with. Uh, they will, parents who select this again or choose it, will attend the comprehensive Arizona accredited online learning program that we have had uh, for many years. The difference is that when a parent selects this, the student's learning will be asynchronous. So what we have had you know, since school began where students were attached to their home campus and to their home teachers was the opportunity to participate synchronously with Zoom meetings, as well as continue asynchronously if the parents had that need. For a choice going forward, our Deer Valley Online Academy will have their own teachers the instruction will be mainly asynchronous with other opportunities that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So specifically to our return to On Learning Campus, you can see here, um, we said the old days. So it, it's kind of like the old days, but not truly like the old days. We will have safety protocols and mitigation strategies that you saw before and you've seen in many of our previous um, board meetings. Um, there will be, though, for our kids and, and the, the parents who um, have been uh, needing, whether it's a kindergarten child or all the way up through high school, the familiarity of, of a classroom structure, peer connections for their students, and that social and emotional um, need that some parents uh, feel we have, we've lost right at this moment. There will be a monitoring and support for our students with disabilities and EL populations. We will have before and after care child care available. Um, kids will be able to access counseling and food services right on site and transportation will be available. I know we have many uh, interested parents in our students who have IEPs or 504s and our English language learner students. So, one of the things that I'd like to share with you is this um, decision-making matrix. And I think we'll click on that link so that you can see what that is. What we would like our parents to consider is, is to think through um, what makes sense for their decision for their children. And so we know that for many of our learners, they have different um, needs. So for example here, if a student struggles with accessibility to virtual learning and classes, probably in-person is going to be more appropriate. However, if we have students that have not struggled so much with that virtual access to learning, 
then perhaps DBOA is going to be the better choice for a parent who has that question. So parents can go through this decision-making matrix and just see where is my child or each of my children um, over the last six weeks and what makes better sense, an in-person or a DVOA um, choice. And we can go back to the, the slideshow now. And then I wanted also to um, share with you that we know, as Jenna mentioned in the previous report, that there will be instances where we will have some children who may have to self-isolate in a classroom, in a pod. Gary mentioned that we will group kids in pods and have space between another group of pods. That if a, a student, a group of students need to self-isolate, that we still have a responsibility to those children for instruction. We also know that over the three-week phase in of in-person, beginning on September 24th and ending on October 14th, that there will be classrooms that have mixed grade levels in them. So for example, some of many of our arts programs at the high school, um, some of our middle school programs have multiple grades that won't start back at the same time. So we know that there will be a time period over the phase in time frame where teachers will have both in-person and remote students. So we have the Return to Learning team who, who has been meeting and identified specific needs. We also have pulled together um, two grade band teams, a K-8 team made up of teachers and campus administrators and a middle school, true middle school, high school team also made up of teachers and administrators. And what you'll see here is the number of teachers um, and administrators who um, joined us for this, um, this endeavor. Part of what they will do is take a look at two models for having both in-person and remote children in their classroom. And I know that's been a, a pretty big fear for many, for many of our um, teachers. However, we feel that we have two potential models that will support that for short periods of time. And that's really what we're looking at is short periods of time. So for example, in our, our phased in model, it's over a one, two, or three week period, just depending on when you phase your students phase in. If we have a group of students who have to self-isolate, that would be for 14 days. So we're just looking at short periods of time. One of the things that this group of educators will do on both of those teams is run uh, a simulation for both of those two models to see which one works best in primary, which one works best in intermediate, middle, which one works best in high school. It could very well be that our campus administrators will say we'll offer both of these and then as a campus make some decisions in that way. This, these two groups are invaluable to us right now because they'll give us great feedback on how we can move forward. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Chunis now to talk through uh, Deer Valley Online Academy. Thank you, Dr. Galligan, and good evening. The Deer Valley Online Learning Program and the Deer Valley Online Academy are the second learning option for Deer Valley K-12 through students who prefer an asynchronous online experience. The Deer Valley Online Program has been recognized both locally and nationally for successful, flexible learning options in online and blended student achievement in recent years. Um, DVOLP, the Deer Valley Online Learning Program, has offered online learning options for middle school and high school students since 2007, and beginning this year, we added kindergarten through sixth grade students. For clarity purposes, and because there are many differences between the high school and K-8 online programming, we will refer to our ninth through 12th grade poll full-time program as Deer Valley Online Program, DVOLP, and our K-8 full-time online as Deer Valley Online Academy, DVOA. DVOLP and DVOA curriculum is aligned to state standards and DVOSD curriculum. They both offer online courses taught by certified Deer Valley teachers. We also offer, offer office hours, tutoring, and daily support from certified experienced educators and support staff. Additionally, both online programs are a stable option for students and families. The next slide shows a little bit about our staff. Um, the principal of the Deer Valley Online Academy is Mrs. Shelley Schubert. 
Mrs. Schubert is excited to partner with our families to ensure that our students have a meaningful learning experience. Our teachers and support staff, as mentioned by Dr. Galligan, offer daily office hours, tutoring, and one-on-one -on -one support. They are certified Deer Valley Unified School District teachers. Uh, when we return to learning in person, students who remain or newly enroll in DVOA will be taught by an experienced certified DVOS teacher. However, as Dr. Galligan mentioned, K-8 students will no longer remain with the classroom teacher from their home school. We will, however, offer a meet the teacher night um, prior to the first day of class for these students. Um, our high school students, however, they currently um, are taught by full-time DBOLP teachers, so they will remain with those teachers. Um, high school is a little tricky, so we'll provide some additional information for full-time DBOLP high school students who are currently enrolled in unique courses. Social and emotional support is built into weekly lesson plans and positive behavior interventions are also embedded in the program. Um, we also offer virtual guest speakers, field trip opportunities, um, as well as support for students in special populations. Dr. Galligan um, also mentioned a little bit about the programming that we offer th through DVOA for special populations. We offer programming for students on IEPs and 504s, um, English language students, and gifted learners. Um, Dr. Galligan also showed you the decision-making matrix, so we ask that families take a look at the decision-making matrix, and we encourage parents to complete the matrix to choose the best learning option for their children. All right, this um, next slide talks a little bit about some of the differences of what is available and what is not available through DVOLP and DVOA. Um, as I mentioned, high school is pretty unique. Um, we currently have full-time DVOLP high school students who are enrolled in courses that we do not normally provide through DVOLP because of the unique situation that we're in. Um, so for this semester, because high school students receive credit for their courses, they can, re they can remain in those courses for this semester. This is one of those situations where Dr. Galligan talked about where the high school teacher um, would teach both students in person and online. So some examples are band, choir, um, AP, IB, dual enrollment, um, and special CTE courses. So they will be provided through the end of this semester. However, starting second semester, if those students decided to stay in DVOLP, they would need to choose a different course for second semester. Um, programs and services that are available for DVOA K-8 that might be similar are gifted English language and special education. Uh, the courses that are not available, however, for K-8 are Bright Child Kindergarten, Renaissance Highly Gifted Academies, Mandarin and Spanish Immersion, or the traditional academy coursework from um, Bel Air. And so we thought about some questions because we know that this is all new for everybody. And so we wanted to be as clear as we could about your options. So here are some pretty specific questions. So if your student is currently enrolled in DVOLP 9th through 12th grade, when can he or she return to learning in person? Because high school courses are credit bearing and um, because of the staffing involved with them, um, ninth through 12th grade students can return to campus in person second semester. So beginning in January, 2021. And um, again, if they, if they stay in those unique courses, those will still be offered through DVOLP this semester. If your child is in high school and is not currently enrolled in DVOLP 9th through 12th grade, can he or she enroll in DVOLP 9-12 right now? Again, due to high school credits and staffing, um, 9th through 12th grade students can register for DVOLP second semester. Now, with that said, we know everyone has unique situations, and so we always work with all of our students. So in speaking with the high school principals, if, I mean, if there, if there will be unique situations, so they ask that you contact um, your high school counselor directly to talk through um, options that might not be up here. So for K-8, it's a little bit different. If my student is currently enrolled in DVOA K-8, when can he or she return to learning in person? The answer is because K-8 students are currently being taught by a classroom teacher at their home school, it's the same teacher, K-8 students could return as soon as that grade band returns to school. So if you have a fifth grade student in DVOA, they could switch to in-person learning because they will be with the same teacher. 
if you have a K-8 Deer Valley, if I, if I sign up my child, however, for the Deer Valley Online Learning Academy right now, moving forward, when can they return in person? The answer to that question is it's a commitment for the rest of the semester. There's a lot of staffing involved um, in these moves. So if you sign up a K-8 student for the Deer Valley Online Academy, they would be in the Deer Valley Online Academy until the end of December, and then they could mm -hmm. choose to return to learning in person in January. Thank you, Dr. Tunis. Ms. Moffitt will share this slide, and it's some of the information that she shared before. So we often get the question, how are we going to respond if we do need to self-isolate either staff or students? And we just wanted to remind everybody um, that we will be following all of the guidance or the guidance that Maricopa County Department of Public Health gives us specifically for self-isolation. As they update it, of course, we will make adjustments. That includes any self-isolation periods that are recommended because of close contact or because someone is symptomatic. That also includes the protocols we will follow for disinfecting and close contact notifications. And Dr. Zerbach also shared with you in our previous report the new requirements around notification to the um, school community itself. And in the last report, I also provided to you a variety of class coverage options that may apply for these um, specific situations. And I do want to reiterate that we will be um, asking our campuses to take a good review of their staffing options so that we can re um, respond quickly and we will do the same uh, district-wide to see if there are staff members at the district level or other campus levels that could step in in certain situations. Thank you, Ms. Moffitt. Now, Dr. Zerbach will start us out with some of our stakeholder communication. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galligan. So this first slide on the stakeholder communication is really a public thank you again to the uh, 15 community members who have met with us consistently uh, throughout the summer and into the uh, fall now. So most recently, the stakeholder committee provided valuable input and feedback to the uh, survey that we will be showing to you here momentarily um, for our parents. And so again, we thank them and uh, we hope that they will continue to uh, work with us and provide that feedback. As far as ongoing communication, um, we have reviewed some of this before and have included this as well in board updates. But as programs and services have resumed um, in person and as we uh, have these discussions about bringing back even more uh, grade levels, persons and services uh, to in person, we have as well increased our communication. So you can see multiple avenues of communication here on this slide. We've had our weekly messages from Dr. Finch, which um, take the format of both written and video messages, our fireside chats, which we've talked about before. We have multiple resources, which we have shown you on the portal. And so on the portal, you'll see resources for any items such as face coverings. Uh, there are HR uh, materials there and also materials from fiscal services with respect to ventilation and other items. We also have our weekly admin meetings where we check in with folks and field questions. We've had staff webinars um, that we have done in the past and likely will continue to do. And again, we will show you that in uh, an upcoming slide. And then employee representative meetings. And so uh, recently, I know myself, I have begun uh, weekly meetings with uh, the president of BLT. I know Dr. Finch is in communication with BLT and Mrs. Moffitt has um, weekly uh, and if not sometimes daily communications with uh, the leaders from some of the employee representative groups. On the uh, parent side of the uh, equation, uh, you are aware of our parent updates, which we have sent uh, on a weekly basis and sometimes even more um, than once a week. We've had our stakeholder committee. Uh, recently, we had our POP uh, meeting last week with uh, almost all of our schools represented, if not all. Uh, with the presidents and our interfaith, giving them information, getting feedback from them. Our parent webinars, which you're well aware of, where we truly have had, I don't know, Dr. Galligan, probably 15 to 20,000 uh, folks who have joined us over the past six weeks, and then our website updates. Thank you, Dr. Zerbach. Specifically for staff, um, Jenna and uh, Dr. Z sent out information to our staff, just letting them know that they would be receiving information 
as far as a staff letter from Dr. Finch and a staff survey that will open up tomorrow through Monday the 14th. And we'll click on that staff survey um, just real quick. Hopefully we can pull that up. Dr. Finch um, has a video that staff, that staff um, will be able to see. Um, and he goes over each of the five main questions in the staff survey. So there is information in the first part of the survey that is specific to our metrics, um, some of the information that you are hearing here this evening, and, and places where they can go to find information. If you would scroll down, please. As they continue through that, um, it asks that they complete this anonymous survey between uh, tomorrow, Wednesday the 9th, and Monday the 14th. And if you would click OK. The questions themselves are, are fairly um, simple. Just who are you? Um, where do you work? Uh, continuing down, um, choose a category of, of where you are in work, um, how you will be returning to on-site work. And then uh, the next one is, if you have any further questions, what might those be? And then the very last thing is if a staff member has specific questions that they would like um, addressed, they just leave their, their contact information and Jenna and her team will um, contact that particular staff member. And this is very similar to the survey that uh, our staff filled out um, in July. And we can go back to the presentation. We will also have our fireside chat this Thursday. Um, those are typically either at 3.30 or 4 o'clock. They last for an hour. As Gary has mentioned, we've had um, hundreds of teachers who have participated over the last three weeks. And then we will have an updated um, staff frequently asked questions posted on the portal on September 11th. We have had different uh, stakeholders, um, staff stakeholders, work with us to identify um, those FAQs that we'll be able to post on Friday for our staff. And then Dr. Zerbach. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. So similar to the prior slide where you saw the series of events for staff, this slide captures the series of communicative events for our parents. So uh, beginning tomorrow, Dr. Finch has composed a letter uh, to the parents, um, which provides uh, the information that parents need in order to uh, begin making that decision as far as if they intend to have their child return in person or to uh, be in the DVOA or remain in DVOLP. Um, we have a parent selection form that is in both English and Spanish uh, for our families. And so that would open tomorrow and then would close at 11.59 p.m. on September 14th. We also look to provide updated FAQs. Uh, oop, because Siri picked me up there on that. So uh, we would like to provide updated FAQs and really that probably is um, not necessarily on a specific date. It will probably be dates. And so as new information comes in from our stakeholder committee um, regarding any outstanding questions, we would look to provide those updates. And then the third piece is very important and that is an additional parent webinar because we have found it to be successful in the reach that we've had when we do these webinars. There is a 5 p.m. webinar that we would plan to do tomorrow um, for our parents so that they could learn more in detail um, about uh, some of these options. We could present information both with respect to the learning options as well as some of the safety options, review again the websites for the operational plans, etc. And that would probably last anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes tomorrow um, for our parents. Those meetings or those webinars are recorded. As you know, it is similar to a, a governing board meeting. And so our parents can access that at the livestream.com slash DVUSD um, website. Dr. Zerbach, do you want um, just to take a peek at either the parent letter or the parent selection form? Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Galligan. If we could open up the parent selection form, that would be um, wonderful. And as Dr. Galligan went through it, um, let's uh, go through this as well. So the first part is an introduction, which again covers much of the information that we have just uh, went over. And so uh, one of the key pieces that we need our parents to know is that the 
uh, student's ID number is requested in this um, the parent selection form. And that's an important piece because that helps Dr. Smith as he combs through the data to make sure that we have uh, matching lines for all of the information that we have. So although we can do it um, without it, it still helps us greatly um, when we have the student's ID and we provide that information where the parent can get that. And so um, there are some links that are involved in here as well uh, where parents can go to so that they can have some of those questions answered. Again, examples are the operational safety plan, COVID procedures, et cetera, for those parents that need to know that before they make that decision. And we also will have some of our photos, which you uh, saw today posted on the website um, by the end of the day tomorrow um, for parents. And so if we could scroll down some, if we could hit OK and we'll go through the survey. So again, it asks for um, the grade level that the student is in. So we would do that. If we're just doing a sampling, it's fine. And then it asks for the parent to select what the um, child would do. So again, would it be in person? And then we could select for, thank you. And then we, of course, we ask for the school and any of these are fine if we could just select. Thank you there. We ask if the parent um, intends to utilize the transportation services, if they intend to use food and nutrition services. Um, and that again helps uh, Mr. Miglarino and his staff as they prepare for the support, asking for the child's first name and last name. And you could just insert anything in there. Thank you very much. And then this one is the um, child's um, ID number, okay, in here. And it is set for a six-digit number. And I believe, Dr. Smith, that it has to be entered in as a six-digit number, right, for it to be a valid entry, okay? So if we hit OK here. And then the parent would hit Submit. And so, of course, the survey or the selection form branches out depending on the selection that you have. So it wouldn't necessarily be the exact same if you selected a different option at the start but a critical piece. And so again, that would open tomorrow and that would close at the end of the day on Monday, September 14th. And so it's very important that our parents would take that, would fill that out, and then we would be sending multiple reminders, robocalls, text message reminders um, to the parents. And so we could um, go back to uh, the presentation there and let's go ahead and um, do the parent letter. Oh, that's okay. We can come back to that later, but it really captures what was on the um, survey or the, excuse me, the selection form initial piece. It captures much of that again um, for that letter. Thank you, Dr. Zerbach. Just um, for our parents, the, the student ID number, is their lunch number or it's the number that they initially went into for their Canvas course? If a parent doesn't know that or a child can't, get it to them. They can always contact their school. They can email the front office and the front office will email it back. So the reason we are asking for that six digit number is it's very critical for us to help identify the specific students. So I know our campuses will also be sending out information to their parents this week that just says, if you do not know your child's ID number, please contact us and we will help you find that. It's just a very important piece of, of the puzzle. I want to go back to and Dr. The, Galligan, if I could mm -hmm. just, I'll ask our support staff, in the, if the, the parent letter is in the PDF, um, which you have, is, is there a way we can bring that up real quick? And so this again is our parent letter, uh, which Dr. Finch has composed and which we have ready to send, um, that provided that uh, there was not different um, direction that would be provided tonight. Um, but this is it. Uh, we don't need to go through it in detail, but it just captures again what we've talked about. And we would intend to send this um, tomorrow morning very early to our parents because it does have information regarding the parent webinar, et cetera, which is happening tomorrow. That's good. We could go back. So just real quick, after our board meeting tonight, I believe the, the staff letter will go out to our staff and then they will have from tomorrow through Thursday, through Monday. Our parents will receive their letter from Dr. Finch and that parent selection form tomorrow morning. So that is, that's our timeline of uh, initial information out. 
And with that, we want to thank you for listening to us. And if you have questions, um, each of us is ready to okay, take um, those questions. I appreciate and thank you guys for all of that information. Um, before we get into specific questions, uh, due to all the timelines here, um, and that this is a preview item, we've previewed it, um, I will uh, throw out to the fellow board members that I would think that um, we might think about having a meeting. Uh, we can't have one tomorrow because we need 24 hours. Uh, but perhaps on Thursday at some point in time so we can solidify uh, if we are going to go with this and that would then uh, work with all of the timelines and and plans that you guys have for staffing, um, for parents to have a, a, a concrete, well, as concrete as medical science will let us uh, know when, when we're going. So um, just to get a, uh, an idea from the board members, if, if there were to be uh, a meeting scheduled for Thursday so we could get a plan, uh, we could get this or whatever plan we, we go with, um, would Thursday be a day um, that would work? I, I have another meeting um, at six o'clock on Thursday. Oh, evening. I didn't mention a time, just a day. Okay. I just, but so I, I'm committed from about six to 7.30 on Thursday, but I'm. So now that's moving it up to four at least. And, and it would be a one agenda item meeting. We could do a WebEx too. So uh, we we can do WebEx. Okay. Mrs. O'Brien. Um, I can be available. Any, because I'll work around, pretty much I can work around any, anyone. Mrs. Frank? Um, would that be in addition to the a meeting on the 15th? Uh, that would be, uh, we wouldn't need a meeting on a, on the 15th. We'll move it up, so it would... Okay, um, so it would be in place of the meeting we had discussed. In lieu of, yes. Oh, okay. And then, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm free after 4 o'clock. Okay, so, so we will uh, get in touch with um, Mrs or Miss Tweedy, because I believe her work day ends at 3.30, so I think 4 o'clock works for her, too. So any, uh, I just wanted to get that out there, so we will um, we'll, we'll plan for a meeting on Thursday at some point in time. Um, and it, will that be in person or um, probably, I, I, I think we can do that. Um, 4 o'clock. I, I don't know. We'll, I, we'll figure that out. Um, okay. as, as we can figure out who can be where they can be because we can only do one tele telephone telephonic person at a time so perhaps we'll do WebEx and if you need not to be in the building then don't be you know don't be here and if you can be in the building be here and you can still WebEx I've been doing that um, forever so um, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out okay okay thanks um, so now, are there any, oh, who wants to start with questions if there are questions? Ms. Frank, oh, I can't see um, you over there. Now I do. I, I do have questions. Do we want to do uh, what we've done in the past where a board member asks a couple of questions and, and then kind of circle back around? I yes, we, we want to be want kind to and considerate. Whole... Kind okay. and considerate. You get two questions and then we move on to the next person. Okay, um, so I guess we're starting with me. Uh, so when we go back for the first uh, phase on September 24th, how many weeks will we have been at green according to county public health? I, I wouldn't know without looking at, looking at a chart myself, but probably four or four or five maybe. Four. Started four and a half, five. Yeah, pre okay. uh, President Ardaway, Ms. Frank, yes, that, that would, what Dr. Finch said is correct. So we would be, according to the ADHS uh, framework, we would have hit the second week last week. And so then on the 24th, that would be four weeks, according to the ADHS um, guidelines for the green. Okay. So as we move forward with this phase in, uh, and I, I'm going to be the worst case scenario person here. So what happens if we start phasing kids, we have our, our kids come in at, on the 24th and then the next phase in comes, but then what happens if 
we start to go backwards and we're now yellow. So I guess my question is, under what circum- what are the circumstances that would trigger a return to virtual for all? And, and I don't, I hate to be worst case scenario, but I think it's important for parents to understand and I want to understand. What does that look like? I can do that one. Okay. okay. Or you could too jump in. Um, the, uh, the recommendation that I gave um, back at the beginning or from, uh, couple months ago was that we would um, start if we had three green and so technically we would start so let's march a month down the road and let's say we go back to yellow um, if you remember the guidelines from the county were um, you could do in person if you hovered around through the five through seven uh, range which is yellow and so um, but in particular answer to your question what will happen um, pretty much every time, because I'm a, I'm assuming schools will come in and out, and versus the district going in and out, and so we will be picking up the phone and contacting um, Dr. Sunshine and her staff at the county to um, give us specific guidance to our zone, and so uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But that's the path we will be looking at the numbers from the district level and then a building level and then contacting the county and getting specific uh, direction from them. Okay, because in, in terms of the yellow, my understanding is we can have in-person school in the yellow range if we're doing the hybrid model, and we're not doing a hybrid model. So, I mean, I think it's important for people to understand, and I'm just looking at, okay, we've had Labor Day, We've had outbreaks at ASU. If that starts spreading community-wide, what can people expect to happen? Yeah, I can't predict the future, but um, we are going to obviously stay in contact with the county and uh, get information from them because, as I mentioned earlier, they might also have uh, had an uptick in testing at, a say, a, a prison facility or something in our neighborhood that we do not know about, and so that's where the county would come in handy. And so we will be getting our direction from the county. Okay, and there's one really quick question before we move on to the next board member. Uh, was the timeline of the phase in opening that you shared with the board, was that shared with the return to learning committee, or is that something that was shared for the first time uh, to the community tonight? First time, you get the first to see it. So, um, yep. It's, uh, it might have been leaked out in the media. You never say never, but um, in general, it's been we tried to get everything to the board first. Okay, so then it didn't go to the return to learning committee first. Okay, thank you. Oh, Ms. Ordway. Wait a minute, I, I was going to say, Frank. I think Ms. Frank, let uh, Dr. Galgan clarify that. Yes. Oh, thank you. So this afternoon we had our return to learning meeting, 2.30 to 4.30. One of the things that we shared toward the end was the grade band work presentation for tomorrow with our grade band teams. And as I was flicking through the slides, one of the slides, because it's not until tomorrow, was the, the slide that you saw with that phased in. And I did ask the return to learning team to just hold on to that until this, this um, board meeting. But that was the first time that that was shared out with anyone, and it was an accident. So I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no apologies needed. I, um, that, that's fine. I was just uh, curious as to um, how that was shared out with the committee and and so on and so forth. So no apologies needed at all. Well, it wasn't a gotcha question. It was just a matter of uh, clarification. But thank you, Dr. Galligan. As you can imagine, that was a hot slide to get. And so we assumed that it probably got out there um, early. But in general, my general philosophy is try to keep a lid on it as long as I can for the board. Okay. Thank you. Like I said, it wasn't a gotcha question. It was just a matter of curiosity. So thank you. Thank you uh, for clearing that up. Uh, Ms. Reed, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, can you take a minute? I don't know who wants to answer this question, uh, Dr. Finch, Dr. Zerbach, or Mr. Miglarino, um, and explain the difference between the difference in interpreting the benchmarks. So the, the two versus the three benchmarks. Does that, am I making myself clear? So we could have used, um, we could have interpreted the benchmarks in two different ways. So could you take take a second and 
and explain sure. that. The, and I the think the one you're number. referring to is the two weeks of continuous decline or the 10 per 1,000, I think it is, or 100,000. Um, uh, if you remember, um, and again, this the, the public didn't see this. I think Dr. Sunshine talked about this um, and when she was on uh, with us as a board. And um, and actually, I, I actually asked her this question. She recommended, because um, remember, two weeks of a decline could still be a super high number. So that's why she recommended the 10. But um, she said that um, you, the one that was most important of all three of those measurements was the 5%. And so that's the one that she recommended. So um, what I do is I lead with the 5% and then I use the other two marks as a reinforcement. So I don't know if that explains it, but that's kind of Dr. Sun and Shine's approach. I don't know, Dr. Z, you want to jump in there? And, yes. just, and just clarifying the 5%, I misread being the percent positivity, um, what Dr. Finch is referring to there. Thank you. Um, and then just one kind of blanket comment, and then we'll rotate and Mrs. O'Brien can answer or could ask her question. Um, I am a little hesitant about our dates that we projected out that we're sending out a staff survey and the parent survey and all of that great stuff, which is really necessary for us to do without the governing board voting it into um, governing board law, I, I guess, as, as we shall say at the moment. Um, and the reason being is I don't want to lead our staff and our parents down a rabbit trail that we can't, for some reason, if we come to vote on Thursday, if we decide to do that, that um, we don't have a majority to enact this plan. And so that's my concern is that I don't want to frustrate our parents and our community members and our teachers even more. So, so, so do you, how difficult would it be for you to put it off by one day? Um, oh, my, my, um, we're, we're being a big, a big monster machine like this. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice Peoria, PV, Scottsdale, and us are all pretty much the same right. in the same window because we're so big. Um, and we need every minute to um, get all these I, students and all these teachers. So, And we would need that information whether... Correct. I think uh, to Ms. Reed's point, we need. still need to collect that data. Yeah. If we can, if we want to argue over the date, which is the right date, then I think we still need that data. And so um, I, it's, I'm, I'm confident that you have confidence in my team and that we're headed on the right path. So um, there is a possibility that um, we could go sideways, but I think we're on the right path. To clarify, because these are tied to specific dates of we're phasing this grade band in on this date and we're phasing this grade band in on that date, I don't want to lead our our staff and our parents down this road that the, their kids are going back to school on these dates if for some reason the governing board decides that that's not going to happen on those dates is what I'm saying. I know that we need to collect the information and yes, let's go ahead and let's collect the information, but I don't want to I don't want people to get the wrong idea and I don't want to create more frustration. I, I, can, I I interject. Interject. can I interject for yes, a second? Please. Because I think what I, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, is I think what Mrs. Reed would like to know, much like when maybe Mr. Miglarino comes before us and asks for board direction when he's working with a committee, is that I think that the board member, what Mrs. Reed is asking for is individual board direction on whether or we individually believe that we would are in support of these dates so that if um, not at least three members are going to move forward with this, that we would not send out that survey tomorrow with those dates because that would be um, like setting off the atomic bomb in Deer Valley Unified School District and, and I'm going to move. <laughs> so I, I, that's what you're asking for. Is that correct? Correct. So I think, Mrs. Ardway, if at some point before we finish this discussion, yep. board members could share if they're comfortable, whether that this sounds like a plan that they want to move forward with and are willing to come back on Thursday to vote 
for? Well, we've got to be careful how, how we how we ask that question, how we how we how we ask that question because oh. we don't want we don't want it to you can still change your mind between now and, and you, Thursday, but I haven't heard anyone yet, even though we're not done, that has given anyone a different direction. So as long as we okay. stay with the direction that, or we stay with your um, recommendation and we don't give you tonight any uh, left turns, different dates, I, I think that that um, is, is about as close to that as we can get. So Mrs. Mrs. That Reed, makes sense. Um, is it okay for Mrs. O'Brien to? Absolutely. Okay. And so far, you're okay with these things with, with, okay, go ahead. Um, so I'd like to go back to the actual, the first presentation where um, I think it was Mrs. Mock was talking about the PPE and sorry, I lost my page on that one. The hand sanitizer, have we done a calculation on approximately how much hand sanitizer a, we think a teacher will go through in a day, a week, sorry. Heather, do you want to do 20-minute presentation on this or just a two-minute? I'll take two-minute two presentation. I can do the quick presentation on this. Actually, Mr. Migley Reno and I did sit down and do the math last week based on the recommended um, dispense you know, dispensing size of, I think it was three milliliters per, um, per squirt or to be efficient uh, in order for the hand sanitizer to be efficient. Right. We determined how many milliliters were in a half gallon bottle. And assuming that a class has, I think we used 25 students in it. Um, we thought a half gallon would last about six days. Hand sanitizer will be a very hot commodity. But it's going to go very quickly. And is hand sanitizer going to be supervised when I, <laughs> I believe use it? Because so. I love the yes. way it smells. Um, yeah, not the hand sanitizer we have. I don't think you like the smell of that. But very industrious. Um, but uh, we have checked with our vendors as well to see how quickly they can replenish. There are some items, certainly at the beginning of COVID when it first started, and throughout that we've seen different lead times for the items. Um, right now, cloth face masks, the face shields, um, not much of a lead time. Hand sanitizer for most of the vendors and certainly the vendor that we've been purchasing it from um, can get it to us typically within five to seven days. So we think we will be able to keep it replenished. We won't know for sure how quickly it will go. Um, and, and a dispenser, one pump of the dispenser may actually dispense more than the three milliliter recommended size. Uh, dispensing, uh, especially depending on um, if it is the teacher or the student uh, dispensing as well. Okay. And then um, hand the hand washing <coughs> troughs that are outside of our cafeterias, are they all functioning and working? I don't know who to look at. Well, Sorry. <laughs> I will defer that one to Mr. Miglarino. Uh, President Ordway, Ms. O'Brien, uh, um, I'm not aware of any uh, hand washing stations that are, would not be working. Uh, if they were, and and any of our staff members were listening to this, we would ask them to complete a a work order, a facilities work order, so that it could be addressed. Uh, and that would be our standard protocol. So if there was a, an issue, um, it, if they notify facilities, then we will ensure that uh, that they are looked into. Okay, and I and I appreciate that. I think as um, school has grown up from the years when I went and there was no hand sanitizer. We do a lot less hand washing and I'd love to see for us to um, utilize our hand washing as much as possible when available and, and make sure those sinks are available. And so I, I, those are my two questions about sanitization, sanitizing and my one comment. Um, I would like to say um, thank you Thank you, Dr. Finch and staff for working to bring together a plan to um, provide an in-school option for our, our students. Um, I know that, uh, and I didn't keep up with it today, 
but there were lots of emails that came in today. Yes, there um, were. I and and you kill me when you send them between noon and six thirty on a school board meeting night. But I read them all, and there I know that there are some people who disagree, um, and and we we cannot make everybody happy. Um, and, and so we have some on both sides of the spectrum and a whole lot of people in the middle. And so I appreciate you all doing um, your very best to, I'm going to say, thread the needle the best we could so that we could provide um, an option for those who need to stay online and those who really need to be back in school. Um, I know that it's been a really long six months for you all. So thank you. That was awesome. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Jim, when you talked about the purging the um, classrooms daily, I think you said that, um, would that also include um, the cafeteria and other common rooms? Like the multi you know, that kind yeah, of thing? Yes, in Norway, yes, it would include um, most of the common areas like the cafeteria, uh, serving area, things of that nature. Okay, and then... Um, Okay, hold on a minute. Um, you already answered that question. So, in in because we know that we have different square footage in classrooms because we have different campuses that were built in different decades before school facility boards said it was not good to have a big wide hall. But anyway, um, and then we got to the trapezoid tables were really great for learning, and the round tables were really great for learning, although they're not good. Um, if there were indeed some of our campuses that needed to have chairs or desks, do we have an idea maybe where there are extras, either on campuses or in the warehouse? So, so if we needed to use them, we would be able to do that if, the, if a teacher found it necessary not to have the table? Um, uh, President Orway, I'll take a stab at this, but I see Dr. Zerbeck is I, I was, that's why I went like this. On, his, on his microphone. Um, so I think it is fair to say that we do have uh, some classroom furniture uh, that exists throughout the district, but probably not enough to replace the furniture that exists um, that you know would create the opportunity to to separate uh, students. Um, so that's why you heard Dr. Zerbach talk about uh, pods, uh, potting of, uh, of kids right. uh, or, or, or creating the cohort groups um, within the classrooms. Uh, so that's the other alternative. We have done a little bit of um, some plexiglass dividers uh, for our, some of our youngest learners in preschool uh, so that they could continue to uh, be at uh, uh, congregating tables, like round tables and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, but I think at this point, I don't know that we would have enough of any of those solutions to be able to universally apply that throughout the district. Yeah, I, I, I did not mean to, oh, all of a sudden now we're going to replace everything with desks. But just if there were some instances where the desk would work much better than a table, people do have a way to make a phone call and see if there's something available. I think probably solution two might be campus-based because I noticed uh, when I was at uh, Boulder Creek, for example, they were moving extra desks out into the hallway. Right, that's what I'm saying. Same so we could so borrow we, yeah. within a region if somebody needed a table or something. Right. You might be able to, uh, to figure help. it out regionally. Yeah, President Ordway, I know I'm aware of uh, what I was going to say is there was a conversation with the title principals last week um, with Lisa Crane. And one of the principals mm -hmm. had voiced that they needed some desks to outfit a particular classroom. And several of the other principals had said, we have some desks, we can okay. get those to you. And so I know through the informal networking that there's opportunities for them to do that as well. Okay, because that, that was, that was um, a, a question from uh, a few teachers um, asking if they, they would be able to do desks. Uh, another question that I've seen on a couple of Facebook pages um, and also some text messages about uh, teachers having to supply um, Lysol wipes and Clorox wipes, even though I know we don't really use them, although we do, um, and parents donate them. The reason why we don't use them is because they don't guarantee the um, 
get rid of the germ thing. But so could you elaborate on the Lysol and the Clorox wipes that, because se some of the sentiment that I'm getting is that now teachers are having to pay f to make sure their classrooms are germ free. President Ordway, I can start this, and, and I think Mr. Miglarino and or Dr. Zerbach can add, but we did provide each classroom with the number 25 sanitizer and five microfiber cloths per bottle of sanitizer as well. And that is the item that is expected for use in the classroom. Uh, the Clorox wipes, uh, we have tried to steer away from in the past. One of the reasons is because when you're bringing in chemicals, um, from outside, we don't always know how they're going to interact with the chemicals that we have and that we use through our custodial right. staff. Mm -hmm. um, I think we do know at this time, and Mr. Miglarino can correct me if I'm wrong, that um, any of the disinfectant wipes like the Clorox or the Lysol will not produce an adverse reaction. We still prefer the um, custodial supplies that we are purchasing through our vendors uh, we know we have the safety data sheets on those items on campus. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with uh, safety and precautions as well, in addition to, you know, what the wipes may or may not um, actually kill as far as germs or bacteria or viruses on the surfaces. Um, I think Mr. Miglarino can add some information as well. We recently actually had this discussion with some of the schools. Yes, I, it, you know, essentially it works out that the sanitizer that we're recommending to, uh, for use is more cost effective than, than the wipes. Um, and that's partly because we're using microfiber towels that we're actually uh, laundering. Um, and also, um, I was surprised to learn that somebody could actually find uh, Lysol and Clorox wipes because- Oh, wait, we, we have people that can find anything we need. I, so. Um, so, but trying to be more serious, the availability of uh, of the sanitizer is is that we're um, suggesting for use is uh, much more readily available. It comes in a concentrate, so um, uh, you know a small amount of it um, as we purchase it will go a long way. And uh, we're certainly not discouraging people from using right because I think there is maybe some convenience um, with the with the wipes. Um, and 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 I do know there have been some very generous people that have donated those. Uh, to our schools, and we're grateful for that, uh, for their efforts. Right. So I, I guess I, I just wanted to clear up that it is awesome that we're getting that stuff in for classrooms, but it is certainly not the um, only way that we have to make sure that our classrooms are clean in between classes. That's so I just wanted to point that out because um, I, I feel very uh, proud of our district that we have been looking for every little nook and cranny that we can do to make sure that all of these things that we've been doing extra, the emotional uh, stuff that, that you don't have to worry about that this year. Maybe there's tubs for clean and dirty things in the art room now, and we're going to supply this and that so that when you're a teacher or an employee, you come there and you get to do your job. So I just wanted to point that out. I know it makes people feel good also. So for the parents, it's a great thing to be able to say, hey, look, you've got gold and Clorox wipes. No one else has them, but Deer Valley does because that's the kind of parents we have. So I, I just wanted to point out that it is not the only thing that um, a staff will have to clean. We will, we will supply everything you need, and when you get extra, that's awesome too. So um, Mrs. Frank? Yeah, so um, just real quickly, uh, I just want to give some feedback on the date since that came up in the last round of questioning. Um, I think the dates that you um, presented look reasonable, uh, and there isn't going to be a magic set of dates that you can provide that will make everybody happy, as Mrs. O'Brien pointed out. So um, giving, you know, okay. looking at all of that and the fact that we've been on green for a number of weeks consistently, the numbers have consistently gone down. I think that the dates that you have proposed in this meeting, to me as a board member, look reasonable. Also knowing not everyone's going to be happy with it. Um, another question regarding those dates, you know, we have some teachers who have elementary age children. So let's say, for example, there's a kindergarten teacher who has uh, a third grade student and a fifth grade student. 
uh, and pardon me if this was already answered, is there, um, is there going to be safe learning spaces for those teachers' children to attend school while they're teaching in person? Because I would hate for a teacher to go, hey, I've got to take PTO time or I've got to take time off because I have no place for my kids to be, and then it starts looking like teachers are just not showing up or we don't have the staffing to make the timeline work, if that makes sense. Uh, Ms. Frank, I think that Dr. Galligan is looking for the slide, but in the meantime, is there somebody who's shaking their head up and down that wants to answer? <laughs> President Ordway, Ms. Frank, yes, that will be an option that we have discussed during that phase. There, we know that we have staff members that could have um, being phased back in, in because they are a kindergarten teacher. They themselves may have a first grade child and a fifth grade child, and both of those students would need supervision at home, and that staff member may not be able to find supervision for the at home. So we have had discussion about our own staff members, even if not previously accessing free learning spaces, would have the option of bringing their children to the um, to those spaces until their own children phase back in. Okay, that's awesome. That answers my question. And then I just had a couple of comments um, before I let you turn it over to the next uh, board member. Uh, a couple of comments about the um, DBOA plan. Um, and that there are no longer any synchronous learning opportunities for DVOA. Uh, I think personally with, for the younger students, um, I would really like to see that there are some synchronous learning opportunities for those students so they get a sense of community in a classroom, that they get a sense of community or relationship with the teacher. I think that's especially important, especially with our younger grades. And just remember that those students um, who have all developed a relationship with a, a teacher from their home school. And if their parents choose to keep them in DVOA for reasons that there's a vulnerable member at home or the parents don't feel it's safe or whatever the reason is, that those students are now going to have to adjust to not having those synchronous learning opportunities and a completely different um, teacher and not seeing those same familiar faces on a Zoom meeting. So I, I would just... Um, I would just really like to request that there be some synchronous learning opportunities and an opportunity for those, especially in the younger grades, to develop uh, a relationship with, with a teacher, even if they have to remain online and aren't able to go in person to their home school. Uh, President Ordway, Ms. Frank, on this particular slide that's showing, we will have daily teacher office hours. We will build in tutoring time, and there will be one-on-one -on -one support for our DVOA students. So there will be synchronous opportunities, and that includes um, opportunities for our special education and our English language learner students as well. But the, the premise of DVOA is more asynchronous than synchronous, um, which is a little bit different than what we've had since the school year began. But we will have opportunities for kids to connect with their teachers daily. And then, as Dr. Tunis mentioned, as each grade level uh, transitions into DVOA, there will be a meet the teacher uh, night so that um, our students and our parents can meet their new DVOA teachers and start to build those relationships. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do have some other questions, but I'll defer to the next board member and ask those when it's my next opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Galvin. Mrs. Reed, do you have anything else? Yes. Um, for Dr. Galligan, for the mixed grade phase in that you were talking about, the grade bands, um, you are going to be presenting the plan and, and vetting those. When will you be able to update the governing board um, with what those plans are and what that looks like and um, the final outcome? Um, President Ordway, Ms. Reed. We can actually share what the, the two potential models are in, in this Friday update. Our grade band teams will um, get a bit of information about them tomorrow. And then on Monday, we'll come back and we'll do uh, some planning around the simulations for both. On next Tuesday, middle school and high school, we'll go through a simulation of one or both of those models. And then on the following day, Wednesday, our k three and four eight 
teams will also do simulations with one or both of those models. And the main purpose there is really to see which will work better with those age level students and the particular configuration of the classrooms. So for example, if we have a large band as compared to a smaller calculus course that has multiple grade levels in it, it might be a bit different. So that's what our, our grade band teams are going to help us with. But we can certainly share with you what the two potential models are this Friday, whether or not those are going to be what we end up with. I couldn't say, but they're, they're pretty strong in what we feel we could actually do with our, our teachers and our kids. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, one other thing, and then I'll pass it on for the next round. Um, I know we were able to um, preview the um, operational safety plan, the in-depth one for K-8. Um, thank you so much for that. It was very thorough. Um, my two two requests for, th for that, um, the first one would be if it's possible, even if it's messy and it's not done all the way, it would be very helpful to me to have the high school operational plan midday on Thursday so I can read through it before we potentially vote on a plan on Thursday um, evening. And then the second, um, if it's possible to add some more of information from that to um, the parents, um, parents' operational plan that they see on the website in regards to fine arts, because I've had a lot of questions about um, how choir and how band will look, and then also a little bit more about lunch. So, um, you know, most of the, the K-6s and K-8s have similar cafeteria tables, and I've gotten a lot of questions about how many students will be able to sit at the table. So just adding a little bit more detail um, about that. And then, sorry, one more thing about the operational plan. Um, if there is a way, and, and I don't know, and I don't want to step on toes, but for teachers that want to be able to access the plan, or if there's a, another plan that teachers may, may be able to read that isn't quite as in-depth as, um, as the admin plan, I think that would be really helpful to our teachers who have a lot of concerns, because I've gotten a lot of operational questions from teachers and um, I don't know what I can share from that, that plan, and I don't want to overstep my, um, my role either. So thank you. Sure, a uh, quick comment. So um, Ms. Reed, most of what you um, saw in the preview is now actually on the web, and so it was updated this afternoon. And so folks, um, including teachers, will be able to go in there, and they're going to see a more detailed um, plan on the return to school safety operational website. So um, it, we will, I think it is actually included in the letter that we have um, to go out and so they'll be able to see much more of that. As far as the um, fine arts, we can absolutely look at that um, and do that. Um, and the lunch, we can see what additional pieces we could add. Um, and the high school one, I will need to um, talk to the team to see um, about that request on there, but we'll do the, um, the best that we can. Thank you. Mrs. O'Brien. Um, we will be requiring masks of everybody, both staff Correct. and students. Correct. Um, but there will, uh, there are medical exceptions that people can have. So what training will occur or be available um, not just for staff, but potentially um, parents and students, because you know it happens. I know it happens. I think it sometimes when I'm out. Why don't you have your mask on? Well, I don't know. They probably have exceptions. So my concern is I, I want our students to be aware that there might be a reason Johnny or Susie um, doesn't have a mask, as well as moms and dads at home, so they know how to handle that, and we're not creating any kinds of bullying situations? Is that something you all have thought of? I see lots of head shaking. Ooh, President Roy, Ms. O'Brien, so yes, to go to the first part of your um, question, yes, face coverings are required. Um, that is consistent with Maricopa County guidance, which is both inside and outside, right, on any school ground um, that we have. And so um, there is also additional 
um, the guidance for, uh, let me stick with staff for a second, and that as we've noted on the portal, there is a document which outlines the expectations there and also informs staff of what happens in these situations that you are talking about when there may be a medical reason um, that someone would do that. Uh, we do have some information that we have shared um, with our district nurse coordinator, Jackie Duarte, and with her nurses with some of the training. And then we have had some um, discussions with respect to the second part of what you're getting at uh, in terms of if there is a situation, um, how do we respond to that, right? Both as a, uh, from the staff, but as a community of learners as well. Okay, I appreciate that. And then Mr. Miglarino, I apologize if you said this earlier in the first presentation you all provided about the the air filters, but those, the, the air filters, the MERV8 filters, those, or MERV8. Yeah, the, the MERVs. The yeah. MERVs. <laughs> um, those are, um, I'm guessing, CDC recommended or they're, they're of the highest quality. Can you help cover that again? Uh, President Orway, Ms. O'Brien, um, the, the, they are, calibrated to our systems so um, so there are certain you know efficiency ratings um, and so the higher the number the more restrictive the flow uh, that would you know help to you know capture more particulates uh, maybe potentially more of the bad things in the air uh, but it's going to slow down the flow of air so it uh, the EPA um, I, I believe, and I'm going from, from recall, I think it's MERV 14, um, they say, to help with airborne um, uh, viruses. Our systems are not capable of that. So it further states on the, their EPA website, MERV rating as high as the system can, can accommodate. And so for us, because the systems were designed as such, um, that's a MERV 8. And... We also need to be able to get the air filters. Um, so uh, a lot of the higher rated MERV filters aren't commercially available. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, you know, we would be, uh, uh, if we were to try and put a higher rated filter in, first of all, it's going to slow down the airflow. They're going to have to be changed more frequently and we're going to have a problem getting them. We feel comfortable that we can maintain our filter replacement schedule with the MERV 8 filters because they are more readily available. Um, and that's kind of what the point I was making is, uh, you know, indoor air quality and air purification, you know, some of those things are components of our comprehensive plan. Um, we are still requiring, you know, disinfecting, sanitizing, hand washing, mask wearing, all of these things combined make for a uh, the, the safe environment that we want for our staff and for our students. Um, but it's not just one thing. Um, but so to answer your question more directly, the EPA would want a higher MERV rating for uh, if it was, you know, the, the main component of our plan. Uh, but our systems aren't capable of that. Our, our, system, our, our mechanical systems nor the, the marketplace right now. Okay. Thank you. And, and I appreciate you leading actually into... Um, one of a question I see frequently or statements are, why are we ret returning? Um, we can't provide the social distancing. And I think it's important, although it was not in tonight's um, PowerPoint, but it was provided two weeks ago, that once we are on three weeks of green, um, the mitigation um, steps are significantly reduced, while Deer Valley will still be doing many of the mitigation factors that are in the yellow. So we are not doing, um, we're doing above and beyond what is required when being in the green for as many weeks as we have been in the green and, and taking as many steps as possible to maximize safety while maximize our educational opportunities for our students. Thank you. I think that uh, unless you have some questions for us to ask you questions about, um, I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm not done, uh, that we have uh, done a, a, a pretty thorough job of going through 
uh, emails. You know, we have the sunshine stories, and that's only three stories or four stories, maybe stories. And then we have our own personal ones because I know we all read our emails and there's sunshine stories in them. But the rest of the emails that talk about the problems and, and, and the sadness and, and the, the need to come back to school are, for me, answered in how we continue to monitor and adjust um, our plans to return to school. So we may not spend four hours asking you questions, which I know is making you sad, because we've been spending all of these hours since, gosh, COVID time, um, is multiplied by eight, because it can't be seven. But anyway, so we've spent all of this time building this plan and understanding what you're saying. So. So I, I think that we've been pretty thorough in, you know, in asking our, our questions. Mrs. Frank, do you have another one? Um, yeah, I just want to, it'll pick you back off of uh, some of Mrs. O'Brien's questions and comments. Um, because I received an email asking about the portable air cleaners and HEPA filters, which are medical grade. Um, and, and I guess, uh, and Mr. Midler, and you've talked about how it's all the mitigation strategies together. Um, not just one particular thing. Um, will teach, but what I'm concerned about actually is is viral load, and I think that really is where a lot of teachers, you know, you get concerned because the more people you have in a smaller space, the greater the opportunities for the virus, and the greater the viral load, and the greater the viral load you're exposed to, the uh, less good the outcome will be for you if you get sick. Um, so. Having said that, will teachers have the opportunity to open their windows? I mean, obviously, if it's 115 degrees outside, you're not going to want to do that, but we are coming back to school um, during the time that, that temperatures will be cooler. Is that something teachers can do to help ventilate their classrooms? Those teachers who do have windows, I know all teachers don't. Uh, what are the thoughts on a portable air, air filtration system, especially if someone had a classroom that they could not ventilate any other way. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, what are the thoughts on that? Or is that something no one's thought of? <laughs> uh, President Ordway, uh, Ms. Frank, the, uh, um, I think we have very few rooms that have operable windows in them. Um, okay. Uh, but we do have a number of uh, exiting doors to the outside. And um, and so we do see uh, that occasionally uh, where a door would be propped open. Um, it uh, I run around and it close pains them. it pains me to say that because <laughs> um, that you know a part of our utility management program is to <laughs> to reduce our utility consumption. I didn't uh -huh. think we were allowed to but, do that. But you know, uh, under the circumstances, uh, I, I think that um, you know providing. It, you know, more outside air uh, is not necessarily something that would be that much of a detriment, especially if it if it did finally try and feel more like September than you know July or August, uh, weather wise. But uh, um, even if there isn't an exiting door to the exterior, uh, as there are in many of our campuses that are kind of under one roof, uh, we still bring in outside air. Um, we, because uh, the ASHRAE standard requires us to do so. So it, it may not feel like it to, uh, to the occupant because they can't, you know, get that sense of the door being open to, to the outside, but we are all, always bringing in outside air in, into the classroom. Uh, and it, it's probably best regulated through the mechanical systems that we have, but if they wanted to augment that with, uh, opening their door or bringing in a, a, you know, a HEPA filter or something like that, we certainly would not oppose that. Okay. Um, and then just one other, this is really more of a comment um, than, than a question for you, Mr. McLarino, but just in terms of uh, some of the research that I've been doing and, and what studies are showing in terms of mask wearing is that what the research shows now is that if everyone wears a mask, your mask will protect you from a, receiving a higher viral load. It isn't just that your mask protects other people. If everyone in the room is wearing a mask, then everyone is protected. And when people wear masks, if they do get sick, they're likely to be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And that's really all due to the mask wearing, and that's what the latest research shows. 
So I would just encourage all of our community members. I mean, I know there's a number of parents who have emailed and they're not happy about their kid having to wear a mask. And guess what? Your kid isn't going to be happy about wearing a mask. I don't like wearing a mask, but I wear it. But if parents want our schools to stay open, then we're all going to need to be inconvenienced for the good of everybody. So, you know, and again, to teachers who are concerned about the viral load, I would emphasize, you know, the mask wearing is just, is really as key, in, in my opinion, from the research that I've looked at. So I'll get off my soapbox now. And thank you, uh, Mr. McLemino. I think that's all the questions I have, Mrs. Orway. Was your cat on your soapbox? I'm sorry, what? Was the cat on the soapbox with you? No, the cat is outside protecting the house from roof rats and straight. Okay, that's enough. Woo. Uh, real quick, uh, carpets, floors, carpets, do they hold, like, stuff in that we're going to be getting rid of? Um, President Ordway, uh, yeah, so... Um, Different surfaces uh, get treated differently. So, um, you know, porous surfaces, uh, you know, um, uh, hard surfaces, even there's a difference between the different types of hard surfaces. But the product that we're using for disinfecting is, uh, is a, a spray. Uh, and so we can um, use it on all the, the surfaces. The reason that we use it just uh, in the evening is because it has a dwell time. Uh, meaning that it has to sit on the surface for uh, a certain minimum amount of time before it can be used uh, and be safe for, for uh, st students and staff to be back in the classroom. So um, we're using the sanitizer throughout the day um, and then uh, using the disinfectant uh, for the nightly cleaning. And then when we have our uh, microfiber God, are they soft? They sound soft. Anyway, the microfiber cloths for the classrooms. Um, so you use one cloth to clean for the whole day. And then there's a place for that to go into the working washing machine and dryers that we have at the campuses. And, and then we'll just get it all back on Friday and we'll have five more for Monday. Uh, President Ordway, yeah, I envision it like probably not being that you'd get the exact same. Right. It's kind of like a sock. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the, uh, but yes, the, the, um, so, in theory, they would have five clean uh, microfiber cloths for each classroom at the start of each week. But by the end of each week, they'll have five uh, dirty uh, or uh, the microfiber cloths that need to be laundered. Um, and at some point in time, uh, the schedule will get worked out between the plant foreman and okay. our food and nutrition staff because they're sharing the same uh, washing and Right. Washing. And so it's just whenever this happens, if we could just find out, like, how many times you really can use a microfiber cloth and it makes something clean. Because I, I know that when I help in the kitchen, we have a, a bucket of something that Hilliard gives us <laughs> that... Um, cleans it and you, you stick it in the bucket and you can use that, you know, you, you continue to use the same cloth. So I just want to make sure that we're, that we know that we can use that all day long and it still is doing its job. Anyway, Mrs. Reed. I just have a few more quick things. Um, I don't know cost wise what this would look like, but I would really love it if we were able to get some portable sinks for some of our campuses who have more pods. Um, I know that they, that they can be purchased and I know that they can be rented. My concern is when I was looking over at the operational plan, um, only having one or two students be able to wash their hands at a time in the bathroom if they don't have sinks in their classroom um, would be a logistical nightmare to me if I was still teaching. So I know that it's, um, been proven that washing your hands for 20 seconds with water and soap is better than using hand sanitizer and hand sanitizer is supposed to be available when water and soap aren't readily available. So um, I know that some of our campuses like um, Stetson Hills and Sierra Verde and uh, Sonora Foothills, they, they have pods where, you know, there's, you know, eight classrooms that all kind of share a, a courtyard. Um, so something I would love to get more information on that. Um, 
I think that for our parents, it's really important for them to understand what our teachers and staff will be doing on the asynchronous learning days before they get um, before they transition back to class. So um, if that could be communicated in a very clear way um, so everybody understands and parents see the value in um, in what the teachers are doing um, from a conversation I had today with a principal. Um, she mentioned that one of those days she would spend would be um, going over all of the new procedures and the cleaning procedures and the safety protocols. Um, so I, I don't want our community to think that the teachers are just, you know, hanging out and drinking coffee and not doing anything. And, um, you know, the kids are at home trying to fend for themselves. So that would be really helpful. Um, and then a conversation that Dr. Finch and I had when we met the other week, um, we talked a little bit about additional safety procedures that um, could be done in the classroom or at the school level that we might not be able to do at the district level in, a, as a whole. Um, and we talked more about um, partnerships. So um, certain schools have certain business partners. Um, you know, I, I think that we've had businesses that wanted to donate um, you know, standalone hand sanitizer stands and, and things like that. And um, Dr. Finch reiterated his um, idea and thought process that it's better for a business to partner directly with the school than rather partner with the district as a whole. So it isn't to say that there aren't other additional safety measures that the PTA or the PTSA or a, a business partner couldn't go and, and present to a school and donate those or partner with them to add more plexiglass or more hand sanitizing stations or sinks. So um, when those opportunities arise, how would you, Mr. Miglarino, do they need to specifically go to the plant foreman or to facilities to get those approved? Like if a teacher wanted to install plexiglass around her desk, would they need to have that approved or can they just do that? So President Ordway, uh, Ms. Reed, uh, it, it would depend on what type of modification was being done. Um, and so we have a procedure called a facility change process. Uh, so if it was a change that they were making to the, the facility itself, uh, so that could be anything from painting a wall to uh, erecting a, you know, a barrier of some sort, as you just suggested, uh, then we would ask them to co complete the facility change order um, for and get approval that way. Thank you. I just want to make sure that our community knows that they can they can partner that way and that our teachers know that that those things are available and they, there's proper channels to go through that way. Thank you. Mrs. O'Brien. Okay, so in that case, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, again, thank you everybody for your hard work. Uh, one more mention, little shout out to Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Bouchon for making those, his crew making those um, customized Deer Valley holders for the hand sanitizer. Julie, I don't know if you, you did see that picture, huh? Yeah, very, very cool. Amazing. Um, so again, we will get a time for um, Thursday. Um, and, and with that, uh, I'm going to make a motion to... Uh, Actually, we have governing board reports and superintendent report still on the agenda. Aren't we like? I do. Okay. Have, sorry, I do have. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot we didn't do that because it's the first time. Miss Ordway. Yes. Just just before we move on to the next topic, I want to make sure that our timeline, if we are okay, still to follow the communication timeline that Miss Reed wondered about. So as far sure as I've heard this evening, I, I believe that is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So uh, this is Frank didn't smack me because she's too far away. So let's go to uh, we have governing board reports. Mrs. O'Brien, go ahead. Oh, another question? What? Oh, 8A. Oh, heck, I did. Gosh, 8A. Um, Dr. Finch, I know you want to turn. Yes, the um, you. I think I put this in the Friday update, the yes. uh, how, you, what you're looking at, where we're sitting today, uh, if you look around the room, this is what it would look like, more or less, 
Um, it'll have less tiers, but it'll have the audience on the left and right. It'll be um, similar to the Dice Art plan. And uh, 25, about 25 uh, tickets, for lack of a better word, will be allowed for the public. First come, first serve. They get a card. They go to the chair that it corresponds with. Um, and uh, that plan, I think, that was given to you on uh, last uh, Friday. Um, if you have any questions to, about it, now's the time to talk about it. But in general, the concept is to limit the space within 50. And if, obviously, wear a mask. Obviously, um, you can't exchange your seat. Um, and once you leave the room, you're, that's it. <laughs> and uh, if you get a card number seven, card number seven, and you want card number eight, you're stuck with card number seven. That's where you have to sit. Well, that makes sense. But in general, that's the concept. Have to clean the um, and chair. we'll use a, you, obviously they can, um, it'll look a lot more like a regular board meeting where a public So how come you don't have cardboard cutouts like they do we in the hockey have game now? Brett, We have a Brett Farb one in Jim's office we're going to put in one of the chairs. Hockey games have them. <laughs> uh, Any questions or thoughts about how to improve it or if this plan works for you? I think that Mrs. O'Brien has a question or a comment. Oh, I, I, um, thank you. This was <laughs> wonderful. Um, you, you can kick me later in the shin, but I, I'm ready to sit at the dais. Um, honestly, for, as a governing board member, if I'm going, and we will be by the next, yeah. by September 22nd, that's essentially two days before we will be sending students back to mm -hmm. the classroom. Um, and if my teachers and my students can be back in the classroom, I can sit next to my governing board member. So you could remove me from this table down here and seat you more. Be I guess that doesn't mean we can seat more people because we still have to keep less than 50. But however that works, I appreciate you going through the effort so that we can have the public back in our meetings and they can address us on whatever agenda items. But I'm prepared to sit at the dais. Mrs. Reed. Ditto. Mrs. Frank. Well, I'm going to wait and see what the numbers are. Well, I mean, I'm following it week by week. Wait, so this plan would probably only be for one or two meetings, and then uh, um, we'll still do the, we'll move from this bottom section and move up to the dais as we approach school. Sounds like a grand plan. All right, moving on to board and superintendent report. Is that correct? Uh, Mrs. O'Brien. <laughs> so tomorrow begins the um, annual Arizona School Boards Association Law Conference, and it will be virtual, um, but nonetheless um, very informative and uh, especially around the topic of, of COVID, which we will have um, tomorrow's pre-conference day and a lot of it's on COVID. So I'm excited about the information we will learn. Thank you. That was beautiful. Mrs. Reed? Um, so yesterday kicked off, or Sunday kicked off, the start of National Suicide Prevention Week. Um, and that is a cause that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, Thursday is International Suicide Prevention Day. And it was also the day that my mom died by suicide. And it'll be nine years on Thursday. So um, just to speak to... The parents that have sent emails regarding um, their concern for their students' mental health, and I know all of the um, teachers and our staff members who have used um, the EAP for their mental health issues. Um, I just, I just want to know that I just want you to know that you're not alone, and you're not, um, you're not fighting alone in in those things, and. Um, that you are so dearly loved and that you are seen. And um, to all those moms and dads that have been sending these emails that, you know, as I'm reading it, they're breaking my heart. Um, I, I want you to know that, that I'm taking this very seriously, that, it, that this isn't a flippant thing and um, choosing to, um, to vote the way that, that I did back in July to extend in-person learning a little bit longer wasn't done um, in a way that I wanted it to, you know, negatively affect um, somebody's mental health or well-being. So, I think we're all trying to do the best that we can given this situation, and um, 
if your students are um, asking out for help, you know, please make sure that you reach out to your school, your teachers, your administrators, the school counselor. The district has a lot of resources, and, and we will do what, what we can to help meet those needs. And the same thing for our, our staff and our, and our teachers. Um, please don't um, fight quietly and think that, um, that things will get better on their own. Please reach out for help. There's no shame in, in raising your, your hand and saying that you need a, a little bit of extra help and love. So thank you. Ms. Frank, how are you sitting, Ms. Frank? Hey, what, what, what? Do you want to do a board report, Ms. Frank? Discretion is the better part of valor. No report tonight. Wow. Okay, you must have been some kind of a drama student. Anyway. No, that's what my mother always used to tell me when I was about to say, blurt out something she didn't want me to say. I didn't know what it meant when I was a kid, except it was she, now time to be quiet. She could have just said silence is golden. But anyway, on that note, um, I'll make a motion to um, end our meet. What? My goodness. Back. Gosh, uh, I didn't forget. I think you she does talk. Did. <laughs> yeah. I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, do you have do you have a report? I do have a short board report. Ahead, short board report from superintendent. Is it short like when we say short? No. Okay, go it's ahead. It's like Dr. Finch short. That's a little different version. Love um, the mask. Can't see my red face. Go I ahead. want to take a second too to um, thank my staff, uh, my cabinet. I've worked them to the bone, and uh, I know mentally uh, they're strained as well. Um, we've had a rough road, but we've stuck together as a team. Done amazing work. Um, we've worked well with um, staff members that have volunteered to help us um, chew through the different models. Uh, our principals have also helped uh, to, um, check out what we're doing and, and run it through the strainer and make sure we're all in the same, going the same direction. So I really want to thank my staff, especially my cabinet. Um, they've earned every penny. Um, I also want to just remind you too that um, we are. I think Miss Ordway mentioned about a month ago. We don't want we don't want to cancel stuff if we can make it run. And so we've, our superintendent advisory council, we've, we're doing kind of a, something totally different. We're not going to have a summit. We're going to have a, um, an SEL, social, social emotional learning concept, um, and try to help uh, Aaron Hatch make some videos. Uh, the students will be making videos to kind of support um, our curriculum. So we're really excited about that. And maybe it'll be kind of like a YouTube type uh, channel concept. So it's totally new, but it gives the students an outlet and also hopefully will have an impact on our district. Last but not least, I've made three laps to every school, at least three laps. And the point is to check in with all the um, all the 39 schools um, since the beginning of school. Um, and so I've hit about 300 classrooms already. Uh, virtual and in person and there's a lot of people that are working from their their classrooms and it's always great to encourage them and so i just want to thank them as well the staff that are working virtually and the ones that are working in their classrooms that uh, uh, we appreciate what they do that's it i have one question mrs ordway <sighs> yes you're making me froggy go ahead i don't want to make you hangry but I know that we okay. normally don't have a second board meeting in October because of somewhere that some group that we're part of the, the Mid State Consortium. Mid -state consortium is that what you're referring to? Yes, mm -hmm. um, but I'm presuming we're not traveling to that, and that might it might behoove us to put that meeting back on our calendar with all that is going on. Just something to think about. Well, we all think about that. And I move to end the meeting. Really? Well, I'm going to second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Well, that would be four. Four for it and zero opposed. And it's at nine, 938.